um, let's start the live streaming, please. So please un um, unmute na and turn off your video.
kaganapan Harapin hamon ng bagong panahon Bigyang ilaw ang tarilan Magsuri pag-isipan ng hulmahan Ng ating linangan Sa puntahan Tungkol sa dulan Ituloy ang pagha Habi ng kamalayan Pag-ha-habi ng karanasan Pag-uhumog ng kasaysayan Tayo't makilahok sa tampo Sa padulaan Ha-ha Ha-ha Magandang hapon po sa lahat at salamat sa inyong paglahok at pakikinig dito sa Tampok sa Badulaan, Saturday Conversations and Theater o Kuntahan Tungkol sa Dulaan tuwing Sabado. Ang Tampok ay isang flagship project ng National Commission for Culture and the Arts, Committee on Dramatic Arts. Simulan po natin ang hapong ito sa isang pagpupugay sa ating bansa at sa ating bandila. Mga kaibigan, para magbigay ng pambungad na pagbati, narito ang pinuno ng NCCA Committee on Dramatic Arts, si Ginoong Felimon Blanco. Mayong hapon sa tanan. Today is the final day of Tampok sa Badulaan, but our conversation will not end here. This whole webinar is just a beginning of reviving this long dream of establishing an Academy of Philippine Theater. On this note, I would like to thank you all for being on board with us in this journey towards realizing this dream. COVID-19 has forced us to stop or pause from our busy lives, and we make this little pause to step back and to gear up for more ambitious work ahead of us. This pandemic has allowed us to slow down a bit in order for us all to converse, share ideas and opinions for the benefit of the theater sector. This closing panel is very close to my heart because we will be hearing sharing of experiences from our outstanding Filipino theater practitioners who went to study abroad. In 2001, I was wishing that there was a theater school or an academy in Mindanao where I can study theater. It was a perfect coincidence when I came across the flyer of an interesting theater school in Singapore naive and a bit young then, well, if you consider 28 years old as young, I wanted to explore theater or performing arts as a career. But where to get training? Intercultural Theater Institute based in Singapore, the then known as Theater Training and Research Program became my saving grace. So here is me still dreaming that day when we can finally have our own academy where we can train our young artists in the pedagogy that is fit 
to the realities of the Philippines. And this is why we are in Tampuk to converse and take that little steps towards this vision of setting up a blueprint of an academy of Philippine theater. For the end time, let me say this. Tampuk is the flagship project of the NCCA Committee on Dramatic Arts, which aims to create a space for the reflection on some of the country's best practices in building a curriculum for theater practice and to examine the challenges in the formation of a curriculum on Philippine theater. In behalf of the NCCA National Committee on Dramatic Arts, I would like to virtually welcome you all to the ninth online conversation of Tampok sa Badulaan Saturday Conversations on Theater. Be inspired of the Filipino artistry and creativity. Taranat makitampo. To share the synthesis of last week's Tampok sa Badulaan, here is the convener of Tampok, Ms. Dessa Quisada Pao. Hello, maayong hapon, kanatong tanan. Good afternoon, everyone. And again, it gives me so much joy and pleasure to be part of uh, the ninth episode of the Tampok Sabadulaan webinar series. Indeed, um, it has been a long journey, but one that has been filled with very rich strands that uh, in the metaphor of weaving, but also of the intersection. So again, um, let me just present to you um, what we have been through, the, an overview of the entire <laughs> uh, previous eight weeks. Now, as we said, it is always important to look at the roots and also the routes, you know, the, the routes uh, going forward and, and to the various directions we wish to proceed. So in, um, again, we started in August 1, <laughs> almost uh, two months ago with uh, establishing the rationale for the Academy of Philippine Theater, um, a framework that was um, presented by Lutgardo Gardi Labad, our Tampo Conference Director. And then we proceeded with establishing a broader context of uh, the Academy. Um, and we had Professor Glessi Atienza, Professor Arvin Villalon, as well as Brother Carl Gaspar from Indanao. And then we then, shortly after, on the, from the 15th onwards, we have been having this panel of uh, three to four uh, speakers for each panel. The first was theater and heritage in relation to establishing the Academy of Philippine Theater. Then we had our illustrious panel, including Marianito Luspo and uh, Joey Lianza, Nestor Horfilia, and Buboy Aguay. Then we proceeded into... Um, a field that is very close to many of us, especially in, in the academe, theater and education in relation to the academy. We had uh, Dr. Steven or Tibo Fernandez, Dr. Sir Anril Tiatko, we had Dr. Sonita Muki, and Dr. Ricardo Abad. And we then we proceeded to a specific sector, especially in the NCR, um, the professional theater in relation to the academy. And we had um, a rich sharing of um, Odi Gemora, Beng Santos Cabangon, and Nanding Josef. And then um, as we stepped into the September, the bear months, we um, went into a discussion of theater in development and governance in relation to the academy. And we had, um, again, our esteemed colleagues, Alfonso Tesoro, Armando Santa Ana, Emmy Roslinda and Sir Jonas Lim. And then we proceeded with a, a very enriching and um, thought provoking discussion of the role of theater organizing and networking in relation to the establishment of the Academy of Philippine Theater. And we had Edward Perez, we had Bobet Mendoza, Romy Narvaez, and Rudy Reveche. And last week, um, just last week, we had a very vibrant, dynamic, and hope-filled panel uh, composed of youth theater leaders and uh, reflecting on the, the role of youth theater in the establishment of the academy. We had Hasanain Magarang, or Hash. We had Chinos Naogsan, um, Ona Kizo, and Sig Pecho. So um, the next slide will... Uh, will present their photos. 
Um, Ona is uh, from the Youth Advocates Youth Theater Arts. Hash is from the Sining Kambayoka Ensemble in the Mindanao State University in Marawi. Uh, Chinos is from Baguio in a group called Salidumai Performing Arts Group. And Sig Pecho is from Comunidad X Sipatlawin. And um, this, the synthesis was uh, drawn by J.K. Anikoche, also of the Comunidad X, and, and a proponent really of um, uh, new things and very vibrant experimentations in theater. And so I will be calling out some of his points, um, not the entire document, but um, from J.K.'s point of view, there were a, a couple of central ideas that emerged from that discussion. One is that there is a variety of existing knowledge that came from different communities and most of them are still yet to be documented. Many of the youth theater leaders recognize that they are part of a continuum. You know, some are reaching their 50th year. I just learned that uh, Sining Kambayoka uh, is on their 46th year. And so you can imagine that uh, there is a um, really a plethora of uh, wisdom and, um, and uh, knowledge that could be called from that experience alone among the other theater groups as well. Uh, second is that as they reflected also on this period of the pandemic, they were saying that these challenging times have also shown us that the precarity of our situation can lead to numerous opportunities to create and archive new practices. No? Um, as uh, many artists have pointed out, during this period, uh, it also made them um, get back to the backlog. No? Um, and one of these is certainly in the realm of archiving and documentation. So um, uh, JK had really several um, important points, but I will just go straight into the summary. Um, and I think these are important to carry on into the discussion today. So the first point he made for the summary is that the academy will serve as a laboratory and platform for mapping trajectories and exchanges. Could be a space to collectivize our vision and action following the principle of cultivating culturally responsive processes and pedagogies. Everyone resonated with the fact that they, their, their experience really comes from the wealth of the experience of the communities where they come from. And, and so anything that we, um, that uh, any praxis that comes out of that has to be rooted in the needs um, of the community and um, culturally responsive to their context. The second point um, from that summary is that in order for the academy to articulate a whole gamut of methodologies brought upon by the emergence of a wide variety of online um, and on-ground practices by numerous practitioners, it needs to be it needs to consciously adapt to the language and vocabulary of the masses and its immediate community. No? So um, I think uh, in, 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 in all of the, the four youth leaders, um, they said that you really have to connect to the people that you serve. Next, please. The third point is that aside from being a cradle for the development, the academy will serve as a platform where exchanges from varying scales, from immediate to the national and eventually intergenerational are facilitated. So again, in the Freirean concept of everyone are teachers, everyone are learners, um, that it, it is not just a, uh, uh, a, a linear didactic, you know, but it, this kind of, a, this academy will be one of dialogues. And then the fourth point is that the academy then should be able to generate capacities that are regenerative, sustainable, and, and care-based that all give importance to oneself, to one's community, and to nature, following the anthropocentric nature of our processes nowadays. So um, uh, that, that is a also a very strong sentiment that has come from our youth leaders that we ought to think beyond you know the human person but also to look at how we can practice through theater 
the ethics of care um, to um, include you know, our planet, our environs, and everyone in it. So thank you very much. Uh, again, uh, that was a very exciting and um, it was filled with um, hope because we can see that the youth are not only, again, the future leaders, but are already exercising their agency and their cultural leadership. So at this point, let me call our conference director, our dear and, and, and beloved Lutgardo Gardi Labad, who will also share briefly like the value of why we even set up this panel on international training um, experienced by our Filipino practitioners in relation to the establishment of the Academy of Philippine Theater. So, Cardi? Salamat, Nanay Ate Desa. <laughs> Magandang hapon po sa ating lahat. Uh, malakas pang tinig ko. Okay lang, Des? Yes. Ah, so, okay, salamat. Uh, those who had been with us for the last, what, seven to eight weeks, so the whole progression of a variety of theater minds who shared with us best practice, best theories of their experiences, and, and they've selected a lot of their experiences na pwedeng baka tulong, baka mailapat sa ating naasam na pangarap pagtatayo ng isang ademya ng gulaang Pilipino. Napakarami po, napakalawak ng iba-ibang turi, turi ng karanasan mula sa professional theater, community theater, theater in governance, theater in education, mga kabataan, mga theater in the, in the different communities. Napakarami. So I think na nangalap natin ang buong breadth ng National Theater experience. Pero hindi ho kami tumigil doon. Sapagat marami sa ating mga artistang nasa teatro, maraming estudyante sa teatro, ay naglakbay outside ng Philippines para lang mag-aral. Bakit? Hindi pa sapat ang natutunan natin dito sa Pilipinas? Bakit kinakailangan lumabas? Bakit kinakailangan? Parang sila Rizal, di ba? Nagbambansa. So, isa kong malaking misteryo. Yung ako po yung kapataan ko, ganun din po ang inasam ko. At napakahalaga yung karanasang yan sa akin. I was 30 years old. Baba, ang mundo ng pandaigligang teatro ay bumukas sa akin. Nakita ko mga works at that time. Sila ang mga benchmark sa international teatro. Sila Peter Brown. Ang mga teatro sa Czechoslovakia, the contemporary theater at the time of the 80s and the 70s in the New York, nakaka-windang at the time. Pero hanggang ngayon pa rin ba nakaka-windang? Anong rason kung bakit kinakailangan na ilang pa sa atin naglakbay para matutunan pa rin ang teatro outside of kita po natin na itong mga karansang ito ay, magtut ay tutulong sa pagbubuo ng konsepto ng akademya. Anong meron doon sa teatro sa labas? Anong kailangan nila? What would be the range of theater training abroad? Kung makikita natin ngayon yun. Anong aspects ng world theater, contemporary theater, theater devising, physical theater, directing, technical theater, theater for education, how is their theater training reflective of their own culture and internationalist culture? Ano mang ginagamit nilang pedagogya? Paano nag-coconnect at nag-aaralan sa practice ng theater doon sa mga countries doon? At how are they relating to mga, mga institusyon na yun? How do they relate to the global market or the creative industries in their regions? And since many of what you share ngayon ay bumalik na, ang mga tanong ko, has their training proven to be useful for them personally as artists? How have they utilized it kung kanilang pinag-aralan? 
how, when they have come back to their own shores, ano kanila mga successes, ano kanila mga challenges. So, we will learn from them, from them tonight, today. What could be useful for the academy to adopt, adapt, learn, or unlearn about this best experience from these different schools, from east to west? And mga models of successful adaptations ba sila? Or localization? So, in general, how will they help relate, help inform our basic interests about our dream, the Academy of Philippine Care, in terms of vision, its direction, its programs, its structures, funding, support, whatever aspects we can connect with this question. So, we're very, very interested and excited to hear our resource persons today. Welcome po sa ating sabadina. Mga kaibigan, para mag- Mga kay Our moderator for today is Mr. Dennis Marasigan, director, writer, lighting designer, actor, producer, teacher, and learner. Dennis Marasigan is an experienced and multi-awarded theater, film, and television director, writer, lighting designer, actor, producer, and mentor who has also held key management positions in various institutions and cultural organizations. He graduated Bachelor of Arts in Theater Arts and Master of Public Administration from the University of the Philippines and served on the faculty of various universities and colleges. He held various positions at the Cultural Center of the Philippines or CCP and served as Artistic Director of the CCP's resident theater company, Tanghalang Pilipino, and President of the Philippine Legitimate Stage Artist Group or PhilStage. Through various grants and scholarships, he observed theater and film practices in various countries in Asia, Europe, and North America. He is currently the head of the Theater Arts Program of Meridian International College of Business and Arts, or Mint College, and advisor of the Mapua Techno Teatro, continuing to mentor young artists while finding time for his creative pursuits in the various media and performing arts. Friends, ladies and gentlemen, let us all welcome Mr. Dennis Marasigan. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Magandang hapon, maayong hapon. I am honored and privileged to be the moderator for this afternoon's panel featuring four young Filipino theater artists. And joining us as our synthesizer for today's session is Ms. Ricamela or Rica Saturay Palis, a freelance cultural worker based in Calamba City in Laguna who is a founding member and currently the chair of the Board of Trustees of the Arts Research and Training Institute in Southern Tagalog, Incorporated or Artists, Inc. As an artist, she creates and performs music for theater productions and advocacy projects and served the NCCA from 1998 to 2004 as executive council member of the National Committee on Dramatic Arts and from 2014 to 2019 as national uh, executive council member of the National Committee on Cultural Education. Rika, good afternoon. Gandang hapon po sa ating lahat. All right. As mentioned earlier, our series of Saturday Conversations is related to the goal of establishing the Academy of Philippine Theater. And as Gardi had mentioned earlier, this afternoon we will try to see what relevant content, methods, and practices we can learn from theater schools and programs abroad through our panelists, all of whom got further training and education in theater in other countries. And so let's proceed to our panelists. Our first speaker is Ms. Mary Ann San Luis. Annie, as she's called by her friends, has held different positions at the National Commission for Culture and the Arts from 2000. She's an artist administrator with more than 15 years of experience in the formulation of formal platforms and practical applications of cultural diplomacy. She has also served as head of the International Affairs Centro Rizal section of the NCCA since 2013. 
Before she finished her Master of Arts in Directing Traditional Chinese Theater at the National Academy of Chinese Theater at Beijing, People's Republic of China, she attended the Central Academy of Drama in Beijing and holds a Bachelor of Arts in Theater Arts from the University of the Philippines, Diliman, graduating cum laude. Currently, she is one of the anchor persons of Padayon, the NCCA Hour, soprano soloist of the Bayanihan Philippine National Folk Dance Company, and she has performed with the Philippine Philharmonic Orchestra, the UP Singing Ambassadors, Kids Act Philippines, Dula Ang UP, Tanghalong Pilipino, among many others. Mga kaibigan, let us all welcome Miss Annie Luis. is just one line of a song from a 12-minute repertoire that I had to learn in two years from Farewell, My Concubine. Slow learner? Well, it could be, but this is just how much time and effort it would take to learn a traditional theater form that has survived the test of time. Good afternoon, maayong hapon ng bagambalim yung amin apo. Thank you, sir, Direct Dennis, for the introduction. Isang malaking karangalan na mabigyan ng pagkakataong maibahagi ko po sa inyong lahat ang aking limang taong karanasan bilang isang scholar sa China. Everyone here is familiar with the Great Wall of China, right? So please visualize that endless stretch of massive fortification systems consisting of stairs and watchtowers and all. As I share with you my journey to the east and how I overcame this Great Wall. I hope that through this sharing, we may be able to pick up some useful information that may be adopted towards the creation of a National Philippine Theater Academy. Flashback to early 2000 when I was enrolled at the MA Theater Arts Program of UP Diliman when I first encountered this uh, Chinese traditional theater form called Jingju, or loosely translated into English as Peking or Beijing Opera. In the Asian drama class, it was a lecture class. Mostly all of the uh, classes in the MA program are all lectures. So we were introduced to the unique theater traditions of Thailand, Indonesia, Japan, and China. Now, being a fan of Bertolt Brecht's Verfremdungsfeit, or alienation effect, that involves the use of techniques designed to distance the audience from the emotional involvement in the play through jolting reminders of the artificiality of the theatrical performance, I was instantly drawn to picking opera. I just saw a video presentation in class and I was completely fascinated with it. I was, to found, I was to find out later that while I was in China, that Brecht claimed to have derived his own theory of Der Fremdungsfeit directly from traditional Chinese theater, where in his opinion, such a dramatic technique had already been in use for centuries. So after realizing that this was the form that I wanted to learn more about, and that I would not get any in-depth study about this anywhere in the Philippines. I quit the MA course at UP right after my first exam. So years after, I actually saw a Peking Opera production at the Cultural Center of the Philippines. It was staged by the NCCA in cooperation with the People's Republic of China. And I could not have been more convinced that I really wanted to learn more. So fast forward first five years after in 2007, I applied for a two year scholarship to study Speaking opera through the China Scholarship Council. In the vetting process of my application, I was told that the program that I had intended to attend would have to be an MA course that would require four years, one year for language and three years for the actual MA program. Since I really considered picking opera as the holy grail of alienation effect, I resigned from my post at the NCCA and left my blooming career as a soprano soloist of the Bayanihan. And so began my adventure and misadventures in, in the Middle Kingdom. In July 2007, I received news that I was accepted into the prestigious Central Academy of Drama in Beijing, or Zhongyang Siju Sheyan, or Zhongxi as how we call it, alma mater of Gongli and Zhang Ziyi. 
I was to attend the Chinese language courses first for one year with foreign students, then attend the regular MA courses after with both foreign and Chinese nationals. Two weeks into the program and I wanted out. I was crying every night because the language courses proved to be the very essence of the alienation effect. That, you know, the floodgates to hell that I never expected. Every day I would stay up until 2 a.m. doing my homework, copying texts and practice writing, you know. And I have always been fast with foreign languages, but Chinese made me think otherwise. This was the first station, the Great Wall of China, so to speak, that I had to deal with. I had never felt more alone in my life. This was the alienation effect that I never imagined. Without the ability to communicate in the local language, I could not order food, buy anything, or go anywhere on my own. Many Chinese words are pronounced the same way, but their meanings change depending on the tone uh, they are said or characters used when they are written. So I endangered myself whenever I opened my mouth to speak or when I tried to go anywhere because I couldn't read the signs or the maps. Our daily intensive Chinese language classes were divided into separate periods for listening comprehension, speaking, grammar, pronunciation, writing, and reading. Language is a culture bearer. And through these language classes, I was slowly introduced to the other facets of Chinese culture that are different from the Filipino Chinese culture that we know and experience here in the Philippines. Since I understood nothing, I decided to excel in one area. So I concentrated on writing. This did not escape the attention of my advisor, who told me that in learning Chinese, or any foreign language for that matter, I had to first develop listening comprehension, then oral communication. Next would be reading, and finally writing. I had it all backwards. Now, the Central Academy of Drama, or Zhongxi, is considered as one of the best drama schools in China, and local says it's the best. Anyway, so, and the school puts a high premium to the taizi, or text, actress dialogue, which we learn in pronunciation class. The most successful actors from Zhongxi, aside from being carefully picked out for their physical attributes, they had to meet the minimum standards in height, weight, and appearance. Yes, they were all beautiful. They were walking gods and goddesses. They had extraordinary pronunciation skills, making them easily stand out among a whole lot of Chinese stage and film or TV actors. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now, every morning at 6 a.m., the whole campus is awakened by acting students belting out their rao kou ling, or tongue twisters, to improve their pronunciation and vocal projection. It was common for foreign students like us to curse at these dedicated acting students who'd wake us up every morning. Anyway, so my teachers knew that I was a singer and expected me to have the best ear in my class. They could not have been more disappointed. Yep, the most embarrassing moment of my every day was the pronunciation class. The teacher would take one fourth of the whole period just to work on my pronunciation. That was how dedicated the teachers were or how difficult it was to teach me probably. Our class originally had 15 students, but only five of us eventually made it to the finish line. With only five students in class, the teacher had more time to work with me and that meant a longer period for my embarrassment. But all of the humiliating intensive work paid off. To further help me, I hang out with polyglots and I eventually developed a good ear for Mandarin Chinese. So good that I could tell if, an, if one Mandarin speaker was from or schooled in Beijing or not. It took me a good two years before I could finally converse in a bit more, flu a bit more fluently and even my Chinese classmates and teachers would stop me mid conversation just to ask me one question. How come your Chinese pronunciation is much better than ours? You know, I did not realize that I spoke better or clearer Chinese than the Chinese could at that time. This was how my school trained their actors, quite intensively. They stop at nothing just to get it right. Even Chinese nationals in the acting department are required to take the higher pronunciation classes with us foreign students just to improve their enunciation. Foreign students had language courses in the morning and extracurricular courses on acting, dancing, and Tai Chi in the afternoon. The dance classes were quite interesting, especially since I learned to work those beautiful large fans and velvet handkerchiefs and water sleeves. Next slide, please. So, yeah, the acting classes were in the usual Western tradition. My acting teacher recognized that I was not new to stage performance and asked me why I chose to attend this school. 
when I answered, I want to learn Peking Opera. He quickly responded, what are you doing at this school then? Do not waste your time. Transfer to the National Academy of Chinese Theater Arts, or NACTA. So for a moment, I was in shock. But realizing that I had no time to waste, I had already used up one and a half years of my four-year scholarship with zero skill in picking opera. I immediately went to the program director and asked to be transferred to NACTA. They refused and said with finality that there was no way for me to be transferred because NACTA was not an affiliate school of the China Scholarship Council. Yet again, another Great Wall of China situation that I had to face. They convinced me to stay by having me interview with prospective advisors for the MA program. But I told them that what they were offering me was also available in the Philippines and taught in English. So why would I come all the way to China to learn these things and fail miserably only because I have to learn them in Chinese? I was, I was ready to fail at something that I knew nothing about, but not fail at Shakespeare and acting just because they were taught in Chinese. So I put a stop to these interviews with the one and only line that I could say in my perfect pronunciation at that time. I came to China because I wished to learn picking opera. The school said no. So I traveled two hours away from the city center to the southwestern part of Beijing to visit the National Academy of Chinese Theater Arts on my own to inquire of my possible transfer. The foreign students department welcomed me, but since I had zero background in picking opera, I had to take up lectures on introduction to Chinese opera, as well as trainings in performance or repertoire, movement, and martial arts. These were all one-on-one -on -one classes for me every afternoon. It was not cheap. I used up all the money I had. With the help from my parents, I was able to enroll. Yep, another grateful moment. I never felt more poor in my life. I could not even afford a McDonald's happy meal. Every morning I had language courses at Jungsi, skipped lunch, and then traveled for two hours to get to my training at Nakta during the fall and winter. I was never made for winter, but I had one clear goal, goal in my mind. Even if I could not finish the four-year scholarship, I had to take home a little of picking opera with me. Finally, I had my audition and interview for the master's degree program. The experience was nothing like any auditions I've ever had. Obviously, only half a year of training was not good enough for me to get into the acting or performing arts department. In China, when you are schooled for a certain degree, you are expected to become a professional in that field. So when the panel asked me why I wanted to learn Chinese opera, they were expecting me to answer because I want to be a profession professional Chinese opera actor. So imagine their surprise when I answered in full confidence because I'm very interested in picking opera and I want to be able to teach it back home. They had never encountered a student in the acting department whose end goal was to teach. Well, obviously you learn acting to be a professional actor. That's a normal path, but mine was quite a novelty for them. While my performance was lacking, they saw value in my voice. So the panel wanted to add another six months of training before I could be accepted into the uh, performing arts department. I knew I did not have much time. So I auditioned and interviewed with another department, directing. I have always been better at giving orders than following them. So I thought maybe directing is the best next, next best thing. So I passed the auditions and interviews. Climbing over that great wall felt so good. The directing program had courses on performance, repertoire, movement, martial arts, weaponry, script writing, directing, literature, etc. There was only one problem left. I was still enrolled at the Central Academy of Drama, and the only way I could afford NACTA was to, tra was to transfer my scholarship to this school and get additional scholarships, because learning Peking Opera was much more expensive than learning them, learning the usual Western theater. So I had both schools negotiate with each other regarding my transfer to the other school, and uh, my last interview with my headmaster at the Central Academy was quite difficult because I could not truly really understand what he was saying. Maybe he was not from Beijing. But what mattered most is that he understood my one and only line enunciated in all perfection. I came to China because I wished to learn picking opera. And with that, I successfully reached another tower of that great wall. The National Academy of Chinese Theater Arts is a public university in Beijing, which offers BA, 
MA and MFA degrees in Chinese opera. It was founded by the Ministry of Culture of the People's Republic of China as China Drama School in 1950. And then it became the National Academy of Chinese Theater Arts in 1978. Um, currently, they have 2,500 students at a given time and um, 250 experienced faculty members. It has the following departments. Picking opera for picking opera, performing arts, because there are other, other forms of Chinese opera. It's not just Beijing opera. Directing, music, dramatic writing, and stage design. And also the Department of International Exchange. Now, in the series of interviews with teachers or audition panels and conversations that I had with my schoolmates and classmates, it always came a surprise to them whenever I said, that we don't have formal courses on traditional theater performance forms in the Philippines, like Sarsuela, Comedia, Arakio. Yeah, we have lectures about them in our drama classes, but never learn them formally in school. So what we have in school are the usual Western styles. At first, it didn't bother me that this was the case. But as I went deeper into the Peking Opera program and I saw how much of the Chinese culture and history is embedded in the stories, the costumes, the performance style, form, and music, I could not help but wonder how a Philippine national theater could have been had we formally learned like Sarsuela or Comedia or another traditional theater form in school. Would we have had developed or produced a true national theater form or a unique performance style? Now, going back to my regular classes at NACTA, the performance or repertoire classes were my favorite. Since I'm a singer, I was assigned the role of Chingyi. Peking opera has four character types, the male, the female, painted faces, and clowns. Each of these character types had roles that are assigned at an early age to each actor who practices it for life. It is very rare for a Chinese opera actor to specialize in two or more roles. These roles are usually assigned based on the personality of the actor. Now, the Qingyi, one of the main divisions of the Dan or female role in traditional Chinese opera, portrays the role of faithful wives, chaste women, maidens in distress or poverty, but noble in character. My theater repertoire teacher later realized that my personality was more fitting for another division of a female role, the Hua Dan, which is a vivacious and lively young female role in Peking Opera. But since I had already put in too much work for Qingyi, I continued learning other repertoires, repertoires for this role. In my two-year training for a 12-minute song and dance number of the character Yuji in Farewell, My Concubine, please allow me to play this video on mute while I, while I talk to save on time. I will put the audio later I will put it on later for better appreciation. So well, while I was learning this, I was presented with a music score that was difficult for me to read because instead of notes, it had numbers and I hate numbers. The prospects of me translating the numbers to notes plus note values while translating the Chinese lyrics into English in my head while minding my pronunciation was too much for my puny brain to process. So, by the way, the pronunciation of Chinese-speaking opera lyrics are based on a Chinese dialect, so it's quite different from Mandarin. That explains why Chinese subtitles are used in live performances of Peking opera. Even the Chinese do not necessarily understand what's being said or what's being sung, but they know the story, they're familiar with the story. The vocal technique was difficult for me because the role that was assigned to me required a combination of nasal and shrill head tones. I could only do the chest and head tones, but never nasal. Resigning to the fury that strong nasal resonance could just be genetic, I resolved to stick to my head and chest tones for high notes and only utilizing nasal neck resonance for middle tones or whenever comfortable. I was constantly corrected for my natural vibrato, but never for the nice sound that I was producing with my chest and head voice resonance. In fact, the teacher has always complimented me for the voice that I was producing. In theater repertoire class, I first learned the song before singing with the music accompaniment. Then came the dance and movement with blocking. The acting part came in last. The lessons given to me were broken down in such manner that it was difficult for me to synchronize everything in one cohesive performance. It was always like I was always chasing after the music or dance or I was trying to understand what I was saying or something else. Everything had to be precise, but we were expected to act out the scenes in our own creative way. 
too much was happening. Not to mention the layers of costumes, the heavy makeup, the wigs, the footwear, and the hand props. In Western theater, we mark our lines with our blockings and mark our blockings with our lines. At least this was the way I was, I was taught. In picking opera, it was so different that what, by the time I had to sync the music with my song and dance, I was, you know, out of rhythm. It took a while before I, could, I got the hang of it. So picking opera really are actors, really are triple threats. They can sing, they can act, they can dance, they can do acrobatics and even more. I remember my first day of movement class, the teacher asked me how far up my, my leg could go then how far back I could bend. I thought it did not, I did not sign up for acrobatics, but I had to learn a little in order to improve my posture and move properly with my performance classes. While we had intensive one-on-one -on -one classes with our masters, we were expected to put in extra hours to rehearse and review on our own after classes. At 5 p.m., a long line of students could be seen reserving for studios or classrooms that could be used until 10 p.m. for solo work. So all the classrooms usually look like this and they had full length mirrors so that we can check ourselves. Please play the video. So the teachers could tell if we attended class without working out or without preparing. I remember practicing my sword dance along the hallway on our, in our dorm just to make sure that my double swords were not held too wide open. So they had to open at a certain angle. It had to be precise. I could not have survived without the help of my accommodating classmates who happily agreed to give me exclusive tutorials for free and workout sessions for dance and movement and even spared, it served as my sparring partners like this one guy here to prepare for weaponry and hand skills class. Bazi Gong, this is the, the video that you're seeing right now, is our martial arts class. Um, I had Bazi classes with other Chinese students to learn fighting routines and martial, with martial arts weapons. So Bazi um, refers to the spears, the swords, the sticks, all these weapons. So it was normal to see students walking around campus with all these deadly weapons. Script writing class required directing students to write their own pieces and direct them for an actual performance. I first wrote mine in English and with the help of senior classmates, the drama was successfully translated into Chinese. Directing my drama, The Intruder, was another challenge that I had to overcome. My piece was a one act play that employs picking opera style presentation with fight scenes without singing. As a director, I expected the actors to interpret their lines according to how they felt and move in consideration of the set design presented. And I would only give instructions and blockings as needed. I never realized that culturally, my actors are used to following what they are told or in picking up for a perspective in accordance to a templated presentation. One noteworthy fact about the theater academies that I attended in China is that they encourage their students to perform whenever they have an opportunity to do so, almost making it seem like they put academic requirements secondary only to performing. So I once asked my Australian Chinese roommate why the school allows acting students to be far away from school for months on end, and even overseas, just to film a movie when they had to attend school, to which I was answered, they're acting students. They have to act. They're going to be actors when they graduate anyway. So that was school for them outside the campus. And when it was my time to be given an opportunity to perform on stage away from school for almost three months during a regular school semester, my advisor readily agreed. Go and perform, he said. You are a performer. Take whatever opportunity you can in order to be trained on stage. Get as much exposure as you can while you still can. Much of the Chinese are confined to strict rules and regulations in their, day, their daily lives. They do not but they do not restrict learning within the four walls of their classrooms. And there I was, always I, I, I was always complaining every day about their culture and the military like training in school, but I never realized that they put a very high value to honing their crafts. With a whole lot of people with the same talents and gifts, one could only stand out if he had trained, if he trains an extra hour or two hours more or puts in extra more work than a regular student would. This was one of the greatest lessons I learned in this Chinese chapter of my life. The last and final stretches of the Great Wall that I had to face was getting my scholarship extended for one more year 
since I used up two years for language train and uh, performance training. MA took three years and writing and defending a thesis in Chinese was one of the greatest achievements I ever had. My student life in China was truly difficult and I always cried for home and believe me, I have attempted to drop out of school, but China had its way of luring me back, either a rare opportunity, the company of extraordinary friends and schoolmates who served as my family, my patient advisors and teachers and the very supportive people at the Philippine Embassy in Beijing who watched over and believed in me. Living in China assaulted me with helplessness and difference. Every day I was stared at and charged with a gamut of bio questions. Who are you? Why are you here? Why are you learning Chinese? Why do you speak Chinese like us, etc.? How old are you? I looked and talked different. The rhythm of life was different. To cope with homesickness and helplessness and poverty, I started to find fault in everything and criticize anything I found strange. After a while, realizing that griping would have changed histories or cultures, I learned to laugh at the very things that I had been complaining about. Suddenly, my rough provincial edges were smoothened out, transforming me into a citizen of the world. I was no longer foreign in China. I, and I did conquer that great wall. Maraming salamat po sa makikinig. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Annie. I enjoyed uh, listening to your uh, lecture. Uh, <laughs> I'm contracting you already so that I'm going to ask you to lecture on Chinese opera for my Asian theater class uh, next semester. And um, I, can, I can identify with you when you're talking about the questions on why we're not teaching Philippine theater in, in our schools. Um, having, having been teaching the course for several years now, that's a question that I almost always get from my students. But what I liked about your, your uh, presentation particularly is how you overcame the series of towers of the Great Wall <laughs> and finding alienation in, the, in, <laughs> in China. Thank you very much, Annie, for sharing. Um, I think that see, Annie, is going to, Annie is going to leave us um, um, earlier. I'm not sure if uh, there are questions for her. Uh, we may want to ask her questions right now, but since there are no questions at the moment, I will proceed with introducing our second panelist for this afternoon. Our second speaker is Ernest Hope Pinambakan, a theater artist and singer-songwriter born in Oroquieta City, Misamis Occidental, but is currently based in Dumaguete City in Negros. Negros Oriental. He finished Bachelor of Mass Communication at Siliman University in 2005 and recently a three-year prof professional diploma program in the intercultural theater, in intercultural theater acting from the Intercultural Theater Institute in Singapore, the same school that was mentioned earlier by Philemon Blanco, under the ASEAN scholarship from the Singapore U.S. Embassy. Hope started his theater journey at the age of 12 as a member of the Liab Cultural Group in Misamis Occidental. He is the former president of the Youth Advocates Through Theater Arts, or IATA, and he acted in the device the Armut performed in Stuttgart, Germany in 2010, and also played the role of Franco in Elsa Martinez Cosconuela's award-winning play, In My Father's House, directed by Amelia Leonardia in 2013, which was also uh, a play where, where Desa Quesada Pam was also a member of the cast. He directed several plays, including the musical Sharon Mani and currently Yata's Baling Mingawa, an entry to the Asian Youth Theatre Festival 2020. His other recent works include three graduation productions and a solo project in Singapore, mentored by different international directors, a performance with Singapore's Choke production at the Natarani Festival in India, and in the Dumaguete production of the Broadway musical Rent as Tom Collins. Hope also co-founded the Bell Tower Project and the Cuadernos Singer Songwriters Collective and recently formed a new theater group called the Salag Collective. Let us now listen to Ernest Hope Tinambakan. Mayong Adlao, kaninyong tanan. Dagang salamat, Sir Dennis, for that introduction. Thank you, Tampok. Sabadulaan for including me in this amazing panel of speakers today. And I am very excited to share about my experience. And at the same time, also very excited to learn a lot from the other panelists who share the same ex experience of learning theater from outside the country. 
salamat. That was a little bit of uh, Kutiyatam exercise, I exercises that I learned from ITI. I would like to thank the people from ITI, especially for allowing me to use some of the materials that I am using today in my presentation. Uh, some of this I got from the website and also from uh, an article that today online about um, a class of its own, what makes Intercultural Theatre Institute different. I graduated from uh, ITI or Intercultural Theatre Institute just December last year. And making this presentation is like a, a wrap up of my experience and also a reflection on how it could be of help in our own local context. But I am that. So just a quick look at the history of ITI and why it was established. It began, as uh, mentioned by Philemon earlier, as Theater Training and Research Program, or TTRP, which was founded in Singapore in the year 2000 by renowned dramatist and also considered as a hero to many Singapore artists, Kuo Pao Kun. And the current director, T. Sasitaran, who, and who are both cultural medallion awardees, um, which is a Singapore's highest ar artistic accolade and basically equivalent to the Philippines National Artist Award, both of them. And ITI was established inspired by the unique experience of contemporary theater in Singapore over four decades and in particular by Pao Kun's artistic vision and multicultural practice. To speak more about ITI and what, and what is its vision, let us watch this video um, of Sassy, our director, speaking about ITI. Fundamentally, it's about Singapore. It's about what it is to work in theatre in Singapore. The program admits people from all over the world the multiculturality of Singapore, the different heritages that make us Singapore. This is a fundamental element of what goes into the training in ITI. The one thing I'm absolutely proud about is the fact that everyone who has gone through the program is still working in theatre in some form, shape or the, or the other. The people that we train don't just do theatre and live performance. Many of them are doing film. Some of them are doing writing. Many of them are also involved in theatre as a means towards community building, as a means towards education, as a therapy. So there are many forms and many uh, uses that you can put theatre to. They are committing themselves to doing theatre well, to doing theatre honestly, and most importantly, they're committing themselves to artists who will go back to their own communities and building communities. So it's about commitment to human bonds. A school like ITI can only survive if the community believes in its values and in the work that it's doing. Not just in the outcomes, but in the process. We believe in a particular kind of education, training of an artist. Enroll now, Madiba. <laughs> so that was Sassy, um, our school director at ITI. Now let me speak about the acting program of ITI. Let me describe to you what it is. So it is a three-year full-time systematic training for professional actors. The first two years of this program are, um, are composed of trainings and studies, of both um, traditional Asian traditional forms and contemporary forms while the third year or the final year is composed of professional works wherein um, actors are thrown into the field of public performance directed by internationally established directors and with a paying audience. Um, it is also based on an intercultural learning methodology that, uh, with an emphasis on inter intercultural work and original creation. So its graduates are expected to be, not only to be actors, but theater creators in general. It is a performer-centered and um, practice-oriented training. Uh, there are readings and humanities classes or discussions where we discuss concepts, principles, and philosophies. But these 
are always supported with practical research and performance explorations. As we always say at ITI, go back to the body. <laughs> okay, padayon tax. Slide four, what is unique about the ITI training program? So as you can see, maybe in the photos, um, two photos on the left are the traditional form training and on the right are the more contemporary application and trainings. So what's unique about uh, the training at ITI is that there's an immersion in traditional theater forms from Asia, namely the Kutiyatam theater from India, which the I exercise earlier that I did in the beginning was part of. Um, Beijing Opera, uh, yeah, coincidentally, um, Annie already spoke about it, but we had also a taste of Beijing Opera from China and also No Theater from Japan, and finally Wayang Wong from Indonesia. However, this is juxtaposed with the more contemporary theater forms and techniques, both the Stanislavskian and post-Stanislavskian actor training techniques. So basically, we also learn, for example, um, Chekhov uh, techniques, Suzuki training, and even clowning, while there's also Tai Chi and yoga practices. And just to emphasize, we are not trained to be masters of the traditional forms, but we are trained as contemporary artists with the experience of and respect for the traditional forms. But Ayon, ITI training is, uh, becomes recognizable in its students because of certain characteristics that is unique to the ITI program. So this is the character, character of the school. The school believes that artists are not made through comfort. <laughs> I, for one, did really understand that. <laughs> and students are expected to clean the school spaces and prepare their own food and organize themselves. Uh, to quote our school director, Sassi, he said that students need to go through a type of human experience to live in a certain kind of way and learn to understand life in a certain way. ITI also expects artistic talent and ability, maturity and commitment and cultural literacy if possible. The rigorous nature of the training challenges the students' endurance and perseverance. So the screening for new students is thorough and very competitive and in fact, Places are limited to maximum of 12 each year, only 12 maximum of, uh, maximum of 12 students a year. There was one time that it, it exceeded to 14, but that's only one time, but every year it doesn't exceed 12. And because of this, we only have 72 graduates since the year 2000 when it opened. It is founded on the belief that theater would have little meaning if it's not connected to life and society. It must make a difference and have a social impact. It recognizes that life in all its variety and diversity and imagination are the alpha and omega of all creativity in theater. It also aims to train socially engaged artists who will contribute meaningfully to the cultures and communities at the same time are capable of working across cultural, linguistic, social, and national boundaries. So you won't be surprised if you see these people in the next slide. Let me pause for a while. We have to resolve something.
Uh, hello po uh, everyone. I hope. Yeah. Um, we need to leave the Zoom first. Kailangan isa talaga. We don't. So that we can be back. Asap. So we leave Zoom and then uh, the same address, same link. Wait lang po, wait lang po. Uh, my, I'll wait, well, let's wait na lang po muna for the IT person po. He's... Okay. na ba ang effect ng ano, maintenance? Yes, na. Yes, daw. Pero as in, nag-fluctuate yung ano, kanina, okay naman yung speed. Oo, tumigil uh, just before the video. Uh, Kasi I'm monitoring the FBA also. Eh. Oo. Alright, okay na po. Bale, magiging dalawa yung live natin po. Yung sa intro, tapos yung intro niyo, tapos magla-live ulit tayo on a separate video na po. Ulit, ulit, papano? I, I will introduce Hope again. Uh, no need po, no need po. So, bali, continue uh, na lang si Hope. Continue na si Hope. Uh -huh. At tapos, iko pa nyo na lang. From the last slide, okay na yon pa rin? Siguro hey, kasi masang... hindi siya, wala siya sa live eh. So, maybe uh, after siya nag-cut, kasi sayang yung ano niya eh. Yung so first um, talaga. Opo. Oh, oh. top. From the yes, top Hope. Hope. From yes, the top. top. Okay. I, I suggest oh. from the top na lang, oh, after oh. the video. Para pumasok na uli sa live. Oh. Okay. So, so bali, babalik oh, ko na po yung live. Okay, go. Right, we're going live in a few. So, we're back. Sorry about that. We will now continue with my presentation. Okay. Again, let me share that I graduated from the International Intercultural Theater Institute just December last year. And making this presentation is sort of a wrap up of my experience and also a reflection on how this experience could be of help in our own local context. This is just a quick look at the history of ITI and why it was established. So ITI in year 2000 started as Theater Training and Research Program or TTRP founded in Singapore by renowned artist, dramatist, and also considered as a hero to many Singapore artists, Ku Pao Kun, with our current director, T. Sasitaran. And they are both cultural medallion awardees in Singapore, which is basically equivalent to the Philippines National Artist Award. It is inspired by the unique experience of the contemporary theater in Singapore over four decades, and in particular by Pao Kun's artistic vision and multi multicultural practice. To learn more about ITI, let us listen to or watch Sassy, our director, speak about it in this video. Fundamentally, it's about Singapore. It's about what it is to work in theater in Singapore. The program admits people from all over the world. The multiculturality of Singapore, the different heritages that make us Singapore. This is a fundamental element of what goes into the training in ITI. The one thing I'm absolutely proud about is the fact that everyone who has gone through the program is still working in theatre in some form, shape or the, or the other. The people that we train don't just do theatre and live performance. Many of them are doing film. Some of them are doing writing. Many of them are also involved in theatre as a means towards community building as a means towards education, as a therapy. So there are many forms and many uh, uses that you can put theater to. 
they are committing themselves to doing theatre well, to doing theatre honestly, and most importantly, they're committing themselves to artists who will go back to their own communities and building communities. So it's about commitment to human bonds. A school like ITI can only survive if the community believes in its values and in the work that it's doing. Not just in the outcomes, but in the process. We believe in a particular kind of education, training of an artist. Enroll now. Yes. Again, that was Tati, our school director, speaking about um, the vision of ITI and what it does. So this is a, a quick view of our acting program at ITI. It is a three-year full-time systematic training for professional actors. So in the first two years of the training, we, we go through um, the traditional forms and contemporary uh, forms, uh, different trainings and studies. While in the, in the final year, or in the third year, we go for more professional work wherein actors are thrown into the field of public performances directed by internationally established directors and with a paying audience. So, feel talaga siya. And it is also based on an intercultural, intercultural learning methodology, emphasizing intercultural work and original creation. So, its graduates are expected not only to be actors, but to be theater creators in general. The performer, it is performer-centered and practice-oriented training. What does it mean? It means that there are readings and humanities classes when we discuss concepts, principles, and philosophies, but these are always supported with practical research and performance explorations. And as we always say in ITI, go back to the body. But Ayon? Now, what makes ITI unique is basically that the students are immersed in traditional theater forms from Asia. We have, for example, the Kutiyatam Theater from India, Beijing Opera from China, which Annie also had a demonstration earlier, No Theater from Japan, and finally, Wayang Wong from Indonesia. But this is based just juxtaposed with the more contemporary theater forms and techniques both Stanislavskian and post-Stanislavskian actor training techniques. So we also learn, for example, Chekhov techniques, Suzuki trainings, and even clowning, while there's also Tai Chi and yoga practices. And just to emphasize that we are not trained to be masters of the traditional form, but we are trained as contemporary artists with the experience of and respect for the traditional forms. But I am. So the ITI training, it becomes recognizable in its students, in its products, because of also certain characteristics that is unique to the program. Like the school believes that artists are not made through comfort. I personally have experienced this and I could really attest to this. Students are expected to clean the school, the school spaces and prepare their own food and organize themselves. And to quote our school director, Sasi, he said that the students need to go through a type of human experience to live in a certain kind of way and learn to understand life in a certain way. The school also expects artistic talent and ability, maturity and commitment, and even cultural literacy at some, uh, to some degree. Uh, and the rigorous nature of the training challenges the students' endurance and perseverance. The screening for new students is thorough and very competitive. In fact, places are only limited to 12 each year. And because of this, for since 2000, when ITI or TTRP opened, we only have 72 graduates for almost 20 years. It is also founded on the be belief that theater would have little meaning if it is not connected to life and society. It must make a difference and have a social impact and it recognizes that life in all its variety and diversity and imagination are the alpha and omega of all creativity in theater. ITI aims to train socially engaged artists who will contribute meaningfully to their cultures and communities 
And at the same time, are capable of working across cultural, linguistic, social, and national boundaries. So you won't be, you won't be surprised if these next people I, that I will present in the next slide, Padayanta, are the graduates of ITI. So far, right now, we only have four graduates from ITI, and that includes Philemon Blanco, who is, of course, the head of the National Commission for Culture and the Arts Committee on Dramatic Arts, and also the artistic director of Teatro Gindegan of La Salle University, Ozamis, and Denise Mordino Aguilar, who is the second graduate and currently the secretary of NCCA TDA. And just recently, together with me, in 2019, uh, Ted Nugent F. Takan, who is currently the co-artistic director of Teatro Gindegan of La Salle University, Ozamis, and of course, myself. Now, let me share also uh, some information about our current students. Uh, so these are our current Filipino students. We have four. Two of them are in second year. Aaron Kaiser, Kaiser Garcia from Quezon City, who also has roots from Tacloban City. And he is currently with Comunidad X under Sipat Lawin. And Marvin Ablao from Bohol with Kasing Sining Teatro Bulanon. And our first year students are Carlwin Liang Paitan. Um, of Zamboanga, and, um, and he's an SPA teacher and uh, theater, in theater and dance, and Ismael of Kapapagaria and Sam of General Santos City. Now, um, let us go to my personal experience. Let me share quickly about my personal, I call it my personal pilgrimage. <clears throat> when I entered ITI, I expected some struggles. Uh, which I think is um, obvious for uh, someone who is in another country, but I never expected it that I'd put myself through what I call an actual pilgrimage, a journey of rediscovery, renewal of faith in my chosen vocation, which is theater, and remolding of the self, not only as an actor, but as a human being. When I learned about the formation of Philippine Theater Academy, my first reaction was, <laughs> because it would have been more helpful for me if I had uh, this, uh, if I were able to go to a local academy before going international. Because when I reached ITI, some of the earlier or first questions that were asked or thrown at us was, what is your culture? What's your roots? What do you know about your identity? And I had a little bit of confusion and dilemma. Being born in Mindanao or from Samis Occidental specifically and being a Christian and a son of two pastors and transferring from one place to another and then finally being transplanted to Dumaguete for, more, for almost two decades now, how do I define myself, my identity? What do I represent? And this confusion throughout the course of the training was transformed into a celebration, a celebration of my own identity which comes from the acceptance of the diversity and multiculturality of myself. And this is true as well to many Filipinos. In the training, I discovered the importance of the awareness of the body as a tool for actors. And what does the body know and rem remember? This is a question that I encountered during the training. Memory is not only cerebral or you know in the mind but also physical or psychophysical what is present in my current vocabulary what influenced it how does it represent my community and my culture throughout the course i begin to basically get to know myself better by listening to my body going back to the body as we always say what can the body learn the process of unlearning shaping and reshaping and remolding of the self. It means that the learning process of the body and the consciousness never stops. There was a process of understanding and increasing the awareness of the strengths and weaknesses of the actor's body and how it can adapt to the new trainings, especially to the traditional forms. What can the body do and give? In application, the importance of understanding what the body can create and communicate through a performance, action, and even 
making life decisions that would make an impact to the community. The heightened awareness of the self could lead into better and effective actions and even more defined, refined and impactful outputs. Let us, uh, allow me to share to you a short video of my own um, journey at ITI. That was the case of Beijing Opera. Yang Wong. So that was how it looked like at IETI in my training. We go through the different um, traditional forms. Uh, you've seen Kuti Atam, Beijing Opera, and Wayang Wong. And then my final presentation, individual project. And of course, at the end of the day, we clean the studios. <laughs> and now, um, for the questions that were thrown at us, for us to answer. Now, the answers here are more of a collective answer by the Filipino alumni and current students of ITI. I, had, I really had the urge to to ask them and be, include them in this um, and in answering these questions. So uh, based on your context or practice and pedag pedagogy, how can these contribute to the shaping of the Academy of Philippine Theater? We say go beyond multiculturalism and celebrate interculturalism. We need to understand that we have differences and what are differences, what are our differences as Filipinos coming from the 7,000 plus islands? In the words of our director, Sassi, we need to get deeper than multiculturalism. We have to accept our differences rather than avoid inevitable, inevitable conflict. We, if we deal with these conflicts and discover how to work together as a group, then that's interculturalism. We need to set up dialogues. So dialogues between cultures, languages, and forms, and between craft and theory, the contemporary and the classical, the technical and the imaginative, the structure and the spontaneity. We also would like to suggest that, the, uh, like, that, that like the ITI program puts the actor training on a new footing, one which is post-colonial, reflective of local traditions in theater, cognizant of the histories and the diverse paths to modernities. We believe that this is something that the academy must pay attention to the discipline of the actor training. Acting, just like any other art, is not easy. We know that. There is a need to look into the process or processes of, of being an actor. And it is bounded or limited only to a number of years of, or not bounded or limited only to a number of years of practice. 
with that, a level of training may be implemented in the academy to create levels of advancement in specific areas of the acting pedagogy. What should be the content and methodology of the Academy of the Philippine Theater? Uh, Padayon? We um, suggest that we incorporate a review and revisit with pract practical experience, emphasis on practical experience, of the Philippine traditional forms, such as Moro Moro or Comedia and many others. And this is parallel with our Asian classical arts training at ITI. We also need to explore what ITI call the post module laboratory or PML. It is basically a practical research allowing the students to explore and discover what the traditional forms give to the actor's body and consciousness. So it is a contemporary theater exploration based on traditional practice. We learn in one term, the traditional form, and in the second term, we are given the chance to explore um, any part of the, of the form or if we have questions or anything that we want to explore further and somehow apply it in a more contemporary manner. Exposure study on Asian forms to find connectivity with the rest of Southeast Asian nations and Asia as a whole. Um, being in a school that is located in Singapore, which is part of the uh, Southeast Asia, I was able to discover a lot of things about Southeast Asia, the differences, the similarities, and it's amazing that we can also learn from each other. But Ayon, what should the structure or physical, human, and organizational look like for the academy? The creation of academic board and examination board, we would like to recommend. The academic board basically evaluates the academ academic quality and recommends academic policies and curriculum, while the examination board respons are resp is responsible for assessing students' progress and evaluate suitability of assessment method. We would also like to recommend at I, that at ITI, students receive, uh, at ITI, students receive a verbal and written report on their performance and a grade of pass with distinction, pass or fail, instead of the usual Philippine educational grading system that we have. We can explore this because um, we recommend that it's a more practical, really practice-based training. And then that the academy must be strategically located where there is easy access to, to um, natural environment and also the city. It is very um, important in our experience that uh, ITI was located on top of a hill where there are trees, there are birds, and even sometimes we have visitors like monkeys and snakes. <laughs> and we get to be one with nature as we train, but at the same time when we need access to props, materials, and what, anything that we need to, uh, do for productions and this, there is also easy access to that and the academy must be able to find ways to provide scholarships and I hope this will happen because none of us at ITI would survive if without this and support systems for the students. So I guess that would be all and we really hope for this academy to be realized as soon as time possible. But Ayon, I am personally hoping that the Philippine Theatre Academy would somehow re reflect the same principles and dreams of ITI, which is to produce artists and cultural workers who are ready to accept the challenge of working with our communities for development and the preservation of our cultural identities. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hope. Uh, that was uh, very interesting. Um, and uh, I, I agree with you that there are many similarities between the Philippines and other Southeast Asian countries and we should build on the similarities even while we explore our individual identities. Um, I will remind everyone to uh, send your comments or questions through, the, the, through Facebook and then we will ask them of our panelists later. I'd also like to mention that so far we have uh, uh, participants who are watching us from General Santos City, from Cagayan de Oro, from Eastern Samar, from Cavite. So our audience is uh, also very national today. All right, so let's proceed to our third uh, presenter for the day. And uh, she is Dominique La Victoria, a playwright and dramaturg from Cagayan de Oro City. She graduated with a BFA in Creative Writing in 2014 and Theater Arts in 2015 from the Ateneo de Manila University. And I'd like to mention that I had worked with her when she was still a student in Ateneo. Uh, we worked together in the Virgin Lab Fest.
And then she proceeded with an MA Dramaturgy and Writing for Performance in 2018 at Goldsmiths University of London, where she graduated with merit. Her plays Chip Line and Ang Bata Sa Drum were staged in the Cultural Center of the Philippines and Virgin Lab Fest in 2013 and 2016, respectively, with uh, Bata Sa Drum going on to be staged in the 2017 revisited lineup and published in the third Virgin Lab Fest anthology. She is a recipient of the Carlos Palanca Memorial Award for Literature for her works Ang Bata Sa Drum, and she won when I was a part of the jury, and Toward the Fires of Revolution. Her plays had been staged in the Philippines, in the United States, and the United Kingdom. Currently, she is a member of the faculty of the Ateneo de Manila University and also of the Mint College. Let us warmly welcome Ms. Dominique La Victoria. Uh, hello. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for uh, having me for uh, Tampok. Uh, it's an honor to really speak about this with, you know, some of the most pas passionate creatives that I've met and, you know, uh, new friends that I've made. Um, I just hope that my sharing of my uh, experience and practice can contribute even, you know, a little bit towards this journey of establishing an Academy of Philippine Theater. So, um, Okay, so uh, just to introduce myself, uh, I know Sir Dennis already uh, introduced uh, introduced me a little bit earlier, but yes, I'm a playwright and dramaturg. Uh, my interest in theater started young, but I, did, I didn't really get into it until I was in college in Ateneo, where I joined Ateneo Entablado, which is a social political theater org. And to be honest, I didn't even want to be a playwright. In fact, I was very resistant to writing plays, but I guess the story is true that you fall in love with theater and then I fell in love with playwriting and you know I also had um, the very best teachers um, um, one of them was Sir Dennis uh, Sir Glenn Mass and Dr. Jerry Respeto who I think should be watching now hi Dr. <laughs> um, and when I started writing plays uh, Again, I didn't really expect to become a playwright, but then I really enjoyed it. And then that's what led me to my journey at Goldsmiths University of London. In terms of choosing which university I wanted to go to, I guess um, I've always been drawn. I've always been drawn to, um, I've always been drawn to, um, to London because of the theater practice, because of the theater practice that we have there. Okay, so I would like uh, for sorry. So uh, for my Goldsmiths experience, I would like to um, talk about three things, which um, these three aspects where um, these um, influenced my practice and really helped develop it into a more well-rounded uh, into a more well-rounded practice um, and. Uh, my Goldsmiths experience was a one-year master's degree where, um, so I'm going to talk about the three things that really influenced my practice, which was an interdisciplinary practice, um, engagement with the community, and introduction to the industry, which was the theater industry in London. Uh, sorry, could we have this on um, full screen, please? Sorry. Okay, uh, so I'm just going to continue. Um, so when I, when I start, uh, sorry, there we are. Sorry about that, everyone. Okay, um, so when I say um, that we experienced interdisciplinary practice, I meant that um, my course in Goldsmiths was the MA Writing for Performance Group, but we had the very, uh, we had the very fortunate opportunity to collaborate with the MA Performance Making and Masters in Music and Sonic Arts courses. So Masters in Music and Sonic Arts is basically electroacoustic composition, multi-channel work, and live interactive performance. And the experience um, and our experience in collaborating together was to devise a performance. Unfortunately, I don't think I have any videos of that late uh, for now. Um, but our, ex our task was to devise a performance together. And the experience was to just really go into space without thinking of theory or movement. And it was a very, let's just see what feels good. Let's just see what feels good to do. And so it ended up that people were, um, that someone was, uh, Playing a, playing a saw with a violin bow. Someone was just putting tape everywhere and um, taping himself to places. So it, just, it was just 
craziness in one space and it really made me feel free, more free than I've ever felt during my theater practice in the Philippines. And it was also good to see what innovations were being made because especially with the Masters in Music for Sonic Arts, they were trying to intersect the rhythm of music visually. So the only way I could explain it was they were trying to make music synesthesia be visible, be visible to the audiences. And they did that through projections, through very techy laptop things that I can't even begin to describe. Um, and we also did uh, creative intervention in text, which was a focus on more a focus more on performance writing versus playwriting. And I found myself drawn to that because again, at first I was very resistant to to playwriting, and it really took me a while to really get into playwriting. But when I discovered performance writing, I really felt more at home. So our modules included sessions on site specific theater, documentary and verbatim theater, and device performance. These are the practices which which I really, really enjoyed. And I really began to question what happens when the script doesn't come first? What happens if its existence doesn't come in until later? Or what happens if the script is just there just for documentation? And one of the things that really touched me during my experience at Goldsmiths was the engagement with the community. So Goldsmiths is a liberal arts college in New Cross, which is in Southeast London. It's in the borough of Lewisham. Um, it's in Southeast London, south of the river, 30 minutes from, a 30 minute bus ride away from institutions like the Old Vic, Young Vic and Shakespeare's Globe. So these things were just really near me. And it just felt like I was, I was in, I just felt like I was sitting with a pool of such creativity. Um, Goldsmiths, uh, New Cross is an area of a mixed cultural background and it's inhabited by many in the African diaspora. It used to be, um, that area, Deptford, used to be the docks of the Royal Navy of the Empire. And, um, actually at the town hall which was uh, which at Deptford town hall which is now owned by goldsmiths there is a there is a small figurine of a ship and there's um people have said that that ship uh that figurine of a ship is a slave ship so it's a very um it's a it's a place filled with um racial tension especially in the subject of gentrification and goldsmiths continuously makes efforts to connect with the community and you know i believe that it can certainly do more but it was very interesting learning about learning about history of empire, learning about the history of the African diaspora just by being there. And um, because I'm a, I was an international student, I was allowed to work. Uh, I was allowed to work for um, twenty hours a week, and I was working at a, I was working part time at a at an African um, Caribbean restaurant, and that's when I really spent time with the African diaspora. And I just um, it was like one of the best things I've ever experienced. And we also worked with student actors from working class backgrounds where we were tasked to devise monologues with student actors from 17 to 18, which further turned into more collaborative projects. And we were also encouraged to participate in community-based activities. So we were encouraged to do scratch nights. Scratch nights are basically um, play re um, performed play readings usually done in pubs or restaurants. So um, this is a poster from a um, music from the, the photo on the left is a picture from a music festival where they had a banner call, uh, that says uh, gentrification is organized crime. So um, I think a few Goldsmith students did uh, music in that party in the park. So that was very fun. The picture on the top is of me and two of my classmates. Um, one of them is actually from Singapore and I really enjoyed uh, working with them and we had a scratch night where we uh, where we showcased um, our new place so these so that what that room is actually just a room in a bar um, in a bar uh, in New Cross area so it was and the bar actually gave us a um, they gave us the space for free because we were residents of the um, of the New Cross area so they have schemes like that and you can see from the Goldsmiths website here that um, this is the Goldsmiths library website and community users from the Lewisham area, which is where Goldsmiths is located, they can use the library to consult its resources. So there is um, the community helps itself out and Goldsmiths helps out the community and they really make the effort to engage. 
And of course, we were introduced to the industry and we were introduced, we held sessions with industry experts, dramaturgs, playwrights, directors, performance makers, even agents. So it was only in the UK that I found playwrights who actually had agents. I didn't know playwrights could have agents until I went to the UK. So they laid out to us in detail the reality of working in the industry. And we managed, we, we, tr we picked their brain and asked um, the uncomfortable questions like what are the suitable rates? What are the copyrights? What are the industry standards? Um, and they also, and the UK also has like an equity program for theater artists. So they um, relayed their knowledge of that to us. And we were encouraged to apply for every con contest, grant slash bursary. We were given a list and we were just encouraged to just apply, apply, apply. And again, we were given insight into how to really um, get into the industry because that's something that a lot of students really yearn for, just the practical knowledge on how to get started on the industry once we're done with our training as artists. So um, just a recommendation for me in relation to the... Um, in relation to the establishing of an Academy of Philippine Theater, I wanted to focus on three things, drama as a collaborative interdisciplinary practice, and I will also give recommendations on content and methodology and structure. So um, I'm, I practiced as a dramaturg. I started in Ateneo and then I furthered it in um, Goldsmiths and I pra I practice, I'm currently practicing it now, you know, uh, despite COVID. Um, so one of the things I really wish would be imparted to future theater artists and young theater artists is to develop a dramaturg's curiosity. Because a dramaturg's curiosity enables you to find links between literature, media, and practice, and connect, and it enables you to connect the dots really easily to see what's out there and to see what's possible. Because the practice of dramaturgy is one that is rooted in asking the question, why? Why do you... Why is your performance like this? Why do you like this? Why do you so and so on and so forth? Um, and I do believe that it is um, it is important for our young theater artists to just keep asking, why is this the way that I am doing this? And because of my collaborations with the Masters in Music of Sonic Arts, I also want to focus on digital and technological innovations. We're moving towards a very digital age where um, we where our practice, we now have the privilege to catch up to what's available and in technology. So the more students are aware of what's available, the more opportunities there will be for creative endeavors. So what I really want is for us to be open for future generations to be really more open to how theater and technology can intersect. And one of the things I really looked into was um, how media how new media like projection, lights, music, etc., how we can really incorporate this into theater because our craft is evolving. And if we want to establish an Academy of Philippine Theater, we can't lag behind because there's just so many, many, many possibilities. And of course, we want to we want to really see what's new. And as for content and methodology, um it would like I said before with the Deptford Town Hall and the New Cross area, Philippine theater practice should be at the core of the academy. So there should be a focus on Philippine theater history and not just Philippine theater history, but the history of the community and not just in Metro Manila. So I have met so many passionate, creative, excellent um, artists from all over the country. And it would be the most amazing experience to just learn and learn and learn from their experience. I would also be, want this academy to be engaged with the community because it is important that the academy is connected to its immediate um, community. Just as we theater makers cannot possibly remove ourselves from the physical space of our performance, an academy or an institution cannot remove itself from the physical community that it belongs to. So just as Goldsmiths is centered in New Cross and it connects to New Cross, this academy should also connect to the immediate community that it belongs to. And what I really um, want to really press on is discovery and experimentation come first. We should not be gatekeepers to creation. Rather, we should provide guidance and we should provide a safe space for a student to just go in and dance and play with whatever they want. Because um, we never really appreciate how much play how much play and experimentation in its purest form is really helpful in cultivating you know re in cultivating very well rounded theater artists um this is one of um one of the things i really appreciated when i went to london was um how their theater companies really connected to their community so on the right you have this was grabbed from theater 503's website they're based in uh, clapham junction in um the southwest of london 
So if you see here on the on the poster, um, their th their, the website of the theater says, are you one of our SW11 neighbors? Well, come on over and say hello. So they give discounts to people who live in the area. And all you have to do is prove that you live in that address. So if you have a letter or a bill or an ID that proves that you live in that community, then you can get a discount on one of their shows. So they really take care of their own. And the second one is from the Arcola Theatre, which is in East London. So they provide creative opportunities every year for the people of Hackney, which is in East London. And they, and you know, it's really that they want to connect to community and professional theatre also functions as community theatre. So it's that connection and that want to reach inwards and outwards that really touched me as an artist and I really believe that we should be doing more of that that professional theater community should still reach out not just to not just to what's beyond but to what's immediate because they cannot remove we cannot remove ourselves from what is immediate um in terms of structure, I also wanted to focus on the importance of recording because right now we really lack on just chronicling productions and projects, journals, records, records, and chronicling should be instilled in the institution. Um, I'm t uh, as Sir Dennis mentioned earlier, I'm now teaching at Mint, and a lot of my students are doing digital performances because now that we're in COVID, we're doing digital performances. And I've told them that if you're involved in digital theater right now during this pandemic, try as much as you can to journal or document your experience because this because this is such an interesting time, this is such a, an unprecedented time, that one day social scientists and, acad and theater academia will be looking for this information about how, about how theater artists adapted. So I, that was my advice to them, that um, record everything you've experienced, during, record everything you've used, all the technology you've used, everything that, everything that you've done to adapt to a digital theater. Make sure to record it because that's going to be very useful one day when we teach a younger generation of theater artists about technological possibilities. And um, I also want to instill the importance of community directors because, again, for the engagement of community. So they're responsible for bridging the academy to the community that it's part of, for, from outreach programs to workshops. Again, it's important that the academy fosters a good relationship with the community because it leads to the formation of community theater-oriented practice. And lastly, um, there, should be, there should be an importance in student safety because um, Student safety, when students are safe, they create really well. And there should be a zero tolerance policy for anything that threatens the ability of students to pursue their creative endeavors, to pursue their theater making. And they should be able to do that in a safe environment where they will not be, they will not be um, crushed. They will not be crushed during their practice, where they will be guided, where they will be guided in a safe and nurturing environment. Because what I really appreciated from my practice abroad was that we were just given a space, a really blank space. And when I had this habit at first of looking at my professor to see to see if um, what I was doing was right, but she was just like, no, just go on, don't do anything, don't, don't look at me, just like go and go and go. And you know, we're in the Philippines, we're so used to following certain rules, to following certain um, practices, to following certain um, instructions that we just forget to just let it all go, see what feels good, don't think about theory, don't think about um, what methods, what methods of performance you're using just perform and let's see what feels great so that's what i mean when i say student safety should be of importance to any philippine theater academy institution and lastly i would like to quote um this article that i read recently um recently during my um practice um, phyllis nag says and we must not forget that popular culture is our greatest resource i've interpreted this in a way that says we must not forget that where we're living is right now so right now there's digital theater there's so many tech technological innovations for theater, what's popular, we should try and incorporate that into our practice because we are looking at the future. And again, theater, theater evolves and the practice of theater evolves. And our Philippine the our Academy of Philippine Theater should keep up with that. Maraming salamat. Thank you so much for having me. 
Thank you, Vix. Um, that's uh, quite a lot uh, that you shared. Um, and I think that uh, there's a lot also that our audience can learn from it. Uh, we've just found out that we also have uh, uh, people who have joined us from Bacolod and uh, North Cotabato. So again, reminder to everyone, please write down your comments or questions that we can share with our panelists later. We still have one more speaker and our final speaker is coming to us from the Americas and literally he's there right now. Uh, where our, our previous three speakers uh, studied in uh, China, Singapore, and uh, London. Our last speaker is currently in the University of Victoria in British Columbia. Dennis Gupa is a theater director, a Vanier scholar who is currently writing his dissertation in applied theater on decolonial theater and dramaturgical praxis based on sea ritual and fishing tradition. He is a fellow of the University of Victoria Center for Studies in Religion and Society and a research fellow in UVic Center for Asia Pacific Initiatives. He obtained an MFA Theater in Directing degree from the University of British Columbia and an MA Theater Arts at the University of the Philippines. And we found out earlier that at one point, she, he and uh, Annie Lewis were classmates. In 2010, he received a scholarship from the Republic of Indonesia to study Topeng Panji at Sekola Tinggi Seni Indonesia. He has co-authored journal articles published by Text and Performance Quarterly, Global Performance Studies International, and Arts Praxis. The Asian Cultural Council awarded him the 2011 Director in Residence Program with the Mayi Theatre Company in New York, and he won the Performance Studies International's Dwight Conquer Good Award the Ada Slight Drama and Education Award, and the National Commission for Culture and the Arts Doctoral Award. Dennis is one of the Asia Society's Philippines 21 Fellows for Arts and Culture. He is the Artistic Associate of Southeast Asian Cultural Heritage Society, and he recently received the 2020-2021 Artist in Residence Program for Ocean Networks Canada, where he will direct a reimagination of the Philippine Indigenous Dance Singkil with Philippine Canadian diasporic communities and Vietnamese Canadian classically trained actors. Makay Vigan, please let us all welcome my namesake, Mr. Dennis Gupa. Salamat po. Uh, maraming maraming salamat. Straight from British Columbia. Yes, thank you, Sir Dennis. Thank you. Maraming salamat po, Tampok. <clears throat> and um, it's been a uh, a blessing and a merit to share this panel with uh, three of the most amazing um, scholars and practitioners of uh, Philippine theaters. And I am really um, humbled to be invited by Tampok. Maraming salamat, uh, Ate Dessa, Sir Gardi, and Philemon. So my presentation will orbit around my current um, commitment in my dissertation project, which I'm completing at the University of Victoria. And this is um, actually, I arrive in this point because of my theater education also in the Philippines, and then to Indonesia, and then here in Canada. So let me show you uh, some of the uh, photos of this work that I'm currently doing. Uh, all right. So um, my dissertation is a question of decolonization. Can we really decolonize our theater? And how do we refuture climate crisis in, in the Philippines? So I'm trying to connect this uh, two things within the practice of applied theater. And um, it is a, a difficult task, but it, I think it's a, it's a necessary task to decolonize our theater and refuture and to imagine the future of our people in the Philippines who are suffering from climate crisis. So these are the three important aspects of my work right now theater, environment, and social justice. So um, I am busy trying to understand how these three things overlap and intersect 
with, uh, within my practice of applied theater. And by looking at the environment, I am trying to foreground the indigenous ecological knowledge. And then I'm adding social justice. This idea of social justice, is that really possible when we are all you know, receiving the crisis of this uh, changing climate? I first uh, began this curiosity when I went to Indonesia to study Topeng Panji uh, with Dosen Nunu, who was my, who was my teacher. And uh, I was taking this uh, traditional mass dance performance. And I was interested in the aesthetics and the movement of this dance. But at one point, she mentioned that the mask, actually the eyes of the mask, were um, reflected and manifested or inspired by a ve vegetable seed. And so this performance, this particular performance, is um, curated or performed actually in the agricultural site. So there's this kind of a connection where the performance is connected to the agriculture or to the environment where this particular practice was emerging. All right, and then I went back, I taught at the University of the Philippines for 10 years and through that, uh, you know, a uh, tenure, position as an assistant professor at the Department of Humanities, I was given an opportunity to collaborate with agriculture, agriculturists, food scientists, and I was able to um, uh, interrogate a kind of a practice that will blend or bring theater in a different, in, in, in a different um, discipline like, you know, agriculture, and biology. So these are some of the examples of the kind of a performances that I did at the University of the Philippines in Los Baños within an ecology uh, of, of, of deep curiosity towards the sciences. And because of my work, I was able also to uh, have an office called Office of Arts and Science Fusion Program and um, here are photos of the processes that I, you know, engage. Merlinda Bobest, uh, I was attracted with Merlinda Bobest's idea of ethics of peace when you say tabi tabi po in the Philippines, um, when you cross a particular, um, you know, uh, landscape or site, you utter tabi tabi po in recognition of the you know unseen characters unseen beings so i was so curious if this particular tabi tabi po can be a research procedure so there was a curiosity for me of looking for new ways of engaging you know um theater research that is empirical but very much informed by our own you know, um, customary practices. So I, I really would like to be a director. And I was so um, uh, privileged to study under Jose Estrella and um, Tony Mabesa and uh, Anton Juan. And I was so inspired where, with their ability to command uh, in, in, in interweaving elements. So I wanted to go deep with my art. So I went to the University of British Columbia and, 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 and study, you know, directing to follow the pathway of these mentors that I've met and encounter. So I went to UBC for two years and um, um, just, uh, I, I think it was a time of my life because I was given the opportunity to spend hours and hours of, you know, just working with um, young actors and in, in a space where I could experiment, explore, and also receive a particular tradition of directing theater. In, in, at UBC, we are, uh, it is uh, a school where we study the text 
and we learn how to codify the text and transfer that text into a living performative um, landscape, which is a proscenium space. That was in 2013. I came there in 2013, but um, Typhoon Yolanda happened. So I was already in Canada and I had the privilege of enjoying the academic, the educational, um, you know, uh, creative emancipation. But at the same time, I was confronted with the suffering of, you know, the Philippines during that time. I was bombasted, I was overwhelmed with the pictures of, of you know, uh, the devastation and the, the ecological decimation that happened in Tacloban and the death was so shocking. So um, that was the beginning of my uh, interrogation of why I was in a foreign land, why I was uh, separated in my uh, homeland in a particular land in which I, I saw the disparity. So I'm currently based here in British Columbia. Yung land area na, namin dito ay 944,735 square kilometers. And uh, the population last year was 5.71 5 million. Compared to the Philippines, ang land area natin ay 300,000 kilometers. Um, ang population is 106.7 million. So there's a kind of a disparity. We are a very small country compared to the province where I'm located, but we have so much people. When I was taking my, um, uh, my MFA, so one of the things that I have to do when I'm so stressed was to buy this one lace classic potato chips. It's like $2.97 to convert that. That's 106.16 pesos. Ang isang kilo ng bigas sa Pilipinas, maybe $28. So yung pambili ko ng ng chips actually could, you know, uh, buy ki um, three kilos, four kilos of rice, which is enough to feed the one Filipino family. So I was starting to question this kind of locatedness that I'm having right now and the alienation and the separate, separate, the separation that that's having in my body while I'm going deep with my arts. So um, after my, P my MFA, I went to University of Victoria to study applied theater, um, carrying these two questions for my dissertation project. How do I decolonize my theater? How does applied theater mobilize the conception of other possible fu futures in sites of precarity? So uh, according to my colleague, Chaya Ocampo go, disasters are everyday like weather. So when you look at climate crisis or climate change, it is also entangled with economic, uh, political and social, you know, um, catastrophe. So you cannot separate uh, the issue of climate change to our political and sociological um, crisis. I was so interested in trying to uh, for ground theater research in answering some of my questions regarding the sufferings of the Filipinos. And how do I do that? So while going deep with the questions of social justice, I have to uh, recalibrate my stories by uh, pos uh, using my stories as a, you know, a positionality. And while I'm studying the sufferings of the Filipinos, I'm also studying my own disaster, you know? So Kennedy Lewis uh, says, said that self-narrative provides methods for, in, for closing cultural divide. So I'm embedding also myself to, to the study of climate crisis in the Philippines. And 
part of my study is to trace all the histories of disasters that I've witnessed and experienced. Among this are, you know, the, the, the revolution that happened in 1986. I was 10 years old and I saw all this. Uh, Tora Tora planes hovering around our uh, house. We've experienced two, two fires in the informal, uh, we're, um, we're an informal settler. I came from a very humble family. And then in 1990 and 1991, there's this earthquake and um, the volcanic eruption. Until now, we're having all these floods. Okay, so how, how do we decolonize? How do we ethically engage um, a, a decolonial theater? This is a picture of me when I was seven years old. I was forced to dance at the Atihan in Quezon City. And I was already questioning why I had to go through this public uh, performance with my body, you know, um, use as an indigenous body. So I had to blacken and put charcoal on my body. And it was kind of a, 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 a shame and so much guilt, you know. Um, there was this uh, gesture of indigenizing and indigenization, but I was already questioning about indigeneity. Right, um, the, the oppressions that happening in the body, or even the erasure that's happening to the indigenous people in which my body was assuming to be as one. Um, these are um, two of important research questions, and uh, I'm combining three methods in my research: autoethnography participatory action research, and practice-based research. So to engage with theoretical, empirical um, aspects of theater study, I think we have to create art, and art becomes the vehicle of interrogation and articulation of new practice. Um, I did my field research thanks to the people of Eastern Samar and also from people from and my collaborators from Leyte. Um, I went back to the Philippines uh, for three times to engage with the community and particularly um, in Tobabo Island. It's a small island in Giwan. Giwan was one of the ground zeros where uh, Typhoon Yolanda entered. And um, in my research procedures, I was contemplating, I was I, I'm using pamate or listening, being cognizant with one's emotion, and pakiki abat, uh, this affective experience of engaging when you are uh, within the sites of intercultural or cross-cultural encounters. This is to Babao Island. And why to Babao Island? You know, it's it's a little uh, island, but I would say and argue that it has a temporal convergences and there's an experience of global flows and colonial encounters. Well, Giwan is where Humunhon is actually located or Magellan uh, um, visited or arrived. And there was this battle, battle of Leyte uh, that also happened in this location. Um, in 1951, there was 6,000 Russian refugees that was uh, accommodated in, in this little island. And of course, um, in 2013, Typhoon Yolanda came where uh, the people from Giwan and Tubabo Island, you know, uh, also experienced uh, encountering um, Korean, literally the world, because of the aid that uh, was given to them. So this is a rich, historically rich uh, 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 site. I'm looking at their spiritual, the procession. This is the procession, and I'm interested in studying the worldview of this particular ritual. Most importantly, the idea of hatag or sharing. So they're creating, they would curate this one 
week of, of, of performances and rituals with food, just like any other uh, Holy Week celebration. But what's prominent in this practice is this idea of hatag, goal, and antos, that they're doing this because they, they have this idea or vision of sharing. So they would prepare for one year, looking forward for this uh, uh, ritual for one year because of this worldview of shared, of coming together. And it's a lot of work and labor. Another aspect of my dissertation is an inquiry on traditional fishing methods called pangal. It's, it's both the implement and also the, 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 the act of fishing. And I would argue this is one of the most uh, uh, friendly fishing uh, methodology. This is Frank, uh, Tatay Frank Abuyen. He's a maker of pangal. And he's uh, an amazing um, artist and, and a creator of, uh, of this implement. I'm interested with the tacit knowledge embedded in Pangal and the embodied way of knowing. Why is that so? So for example, I've, um, there's this an epistemology of esquala or triangulation. So to be able to catch the fish, Tatay Frank would go to the, you know, the ocean and look around. He has this imagined esquala or tri-square in his mind. And um, so he would relate to the terrestrial landscape. He would have tigaman or signs. He would look at the, for example, lubi at one point. And then there's also another point and probably the tip of the hill. Um, and then he will drop the pangal. So this pangal doesn't have a boy. After one week or two, he will go back and recover the pangal by looking at these two terrestrial signs, 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 all right? So what does that, this tell us? It tells us that Tatay Frank is a mathematician. <laughs> he has ethnomathematics in his, you know, in his body. He knows geometry. He knows the idea of triangulation by relating to his environment or the natural setting, all right? There's a network. He can read the networks of triangles that's being formed. He has an idea of an, how analogs work, all right? And I would like to unpack Pangal through these uh, ideas of ideas of, uh, you know, uh, the science, the empirical, uh, it, that's embedded in the act of fishing, the relationship, the human and non-human relationship, uh, the Povinelli's, uh, I'd like to also borrow Povinelli's idea of the thing of a localizing force. It is not part or a whole, it is part of a series of entangled intensities, right? It is a materiality that is living, evolving, and is important, to their identity as people. Another is the affirmative contingency that they can theorize you know, through these material things. They're able to think cerebral, cerebral, uh, in a very cerebral uh, state. Now, how do I uh, translate this in the uh, practice of applied theater? So you see, creating a pangal is a process also. There's a genius in creating this Pangal. I look at it as an art, all right, because they have, you know, words to, to, to make meaning of this materiality. So, for example, uh, the gathering of bamboos, because it's made of kalinkingan, so Tate Frank would go to the bukid and uh, farm the bamboos, so that's called pagpulod, and then he would cut this bamboos, into um, sticks, he calls this utud utod, and he would polish it, pagnawi, and then the weaving happens, larahon. And you know, when I was working with these teachers, because they're 
introduced to the Pangal, they know Pangal, instead of me, you know, imposing the lexis of theater, the, the, the Western theater, I've used this I, the idea of Pangal as a process of creating theater. So for example, gathering of stories becomes Pagpulod, our rehearsal, uh, is now utod utod and polishing of the theater performance is now pagnawe and the preview, the theatrical preview or the performance preview is now weaving or larahon. Um, so we are borrowing and appropriating the language of or the lexis of pangal, which is all actually is the very nature and the very DNA of this pangal because Pangal also went through an evolution. So we use that kind of ethos. Now, um, in our textual structuring, we have the procession. So instead of using scenes and acts, my collaborator, um, um, RJ Babon, who's from Sirang uh, Theater in Sam, he thought of Kaagi you know, the, the, the station of the crosses for our performance decks. Now, because of uh, love for uh, affection towards Pangal, I went to National Museum and asked them if they're open to, you know, exhibit and to have one Pangal in their uh, in the institution and the community members from Tutubabo said, yeah, please donate. So Pangal is now, we're proud to say that Pangal is now part of the exhibition of uh, National Museum to circulate the knowledge. Um, these are the things that I have to, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm thinking right now. Okay, so in, we have to engage difficult questions. It is about the innovating methods of in, inquiry, um, intersectional solidarity based from indigenous principles. I want to highlight community of practice, rehearse possible futures that connect the local, national, regional, and even the transnational communities. These are the performances that I did. We were asked to perform in, you know, in the municipality, we cleaned the Gabaldon Hall, which was destroyed by Typhoon Yolanda, and we used that as a performance space. These are the teachers. And then I was so lucky to meet uh, Joey Lianza of Siram Theater and Sam. We did um, an international theater festival that would gather the local policymakers so that we can talk about indigenous knowledge and also policies, local policies and climate mitigation. I brought uh, three Canadian artists to perform here in Canada. Okay, uh, we did this kind of a transnational engagement of the stories that we've obtained and our stories and work with um, stu theater students in the University of Victoria um, and toured Winnipeg and Vancouver. This is the performance that we did. I <laughs> Now, okay, I'm kind of rushing. So um, let me end with this. So what is island-based dramaturgy and pedagogy of disaster? Really, this is a, a conception of a practice, a dramaturgical practice in which it is informed by indigenous worldview. And I'd like to foreground commu the community as a participant in the co-creation of the performances and mobilization of imaginaries from the people and from this, their embodied experience. And within this practice, there's this conception of the trans transfiguration of local transnational community artist collaboration. And it could lead to transnational collaboration. Currently, I am you know, col collaborating with this um, Filipino uh, communities here in Canada and Southeast Asian Canada. And there are, I'd like to um, have a, a kind of an exchange of this dram dramaturgical practice, not just to the Filipinos in the Philippines, but also to the Filipinos here in, in the diasporic community. 
So I'd like to end with that. And I apologize for overwhelming you with my work. It comes from my uh, interest of sharing. Thank you. Thank you, Dennis. Uh, thank you to all our speakers. And I would like to remind our audience uh, to send your questions so that we can ask them of our panelists uh, so that we can make the most out of the time and the talent that they, have, uh, that they are making available to us. Um, uh, to, to start the, the open forum now, may I ask a question particularly for uh, Dennis and for um, uh, Dominique. Um, Dennis, you mentioned that um, you have now found yourself away from the country for some time and that at the outset um, you, you felt that you had to go out of the country in order to uh, follow the steps, the footsteps of the mentors that taught you and that you are now finding yourself uh, uh, learning and transferring and exploring um, in a place that is outside of the country. Um, my question therefore for you and also for Dominique, uh, because Dominique also mentioned that uh, she went to London because she wanted to go to London because she felt it was where she can learn what she wanted to learn is that if if uh, if things were different what aspects of what you have learned or what you are learning would you wish that were available to you here in the philippines so that um, there wouldn't have been a need perhaps for you to leave or in in a way that would be um, those who would follow after you will will then find that uh, that are available uh, to this and i'm asking that in relation to the question of course of the of the foundation or the creation of a, a academy of a philippine theater so again the question is what aspects of what you have learned or what aspects of what you are learning would you wish had been available to you in the philippines and therefore would have or would have been available or would be available to those who will follow after you. Uh, Dennis first and then Dominique. I think it is about the commitment to deepen our own imaginary. You know, um, the, the, the theater school at the University of British Columbia, they're really, they know the tradition that they want to bring to their students. They know what kind of skill set that the student should acquire. And it's, it's really coming from, um, you know, Western uh, Stanislavski. You have to, when you graduate, you know how to codify the text and you know how to communicate this particular tradition to, or translate this particular tradition to the living performance uh, space, right? Um, I, I think that we are, I was, in, I was um, introduced to Philippine theater mm. and I, 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 I hope I could go deeper with that. I really hope that I could, mm -hmm. I could learn um, the, the rigors of studying Philippine theater. Mm -hmm. And rigors means excellence. And it's, you know, we elevate it and there's an opening to, to, to innovation until we say this is an art that is um, articulate, immediate, and worth uh, contributing to the global theater. Mm -hmm. So right. uh, probably that's, that's my, uh, what I'm thinking right now. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, mm -hmm. I, I think it's, a, it's an answer of tradition, of deepening tradition so that it could continue to evolve. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you, Dennis. Dominique, what, uh, how would you respond to uh, that? Uh, in, to, in connection to what uh, Dennis said about tradition, what I really noticed was for them, a master's was really just a furthering because 
things like Shakespeare or because they have such a very long, the UK has such a long history of theater that Shakespeare has been drilled to them since elementary school. So these are things that they already knew about. And I, that's why I wish that we also had that during my elementary theater, edu my elementary education wasn't just um, literature or short stories. I also yearned for place and I think I could have used that and appreciated theater more had I had that but more I also what I also um yearned for as well was just space um I know that the Philippines um we have lots of theater spaces but accessibility is another question they're sometimes limited to educational institutions or government institutions so it was it's really just trying to access like just a space and there it's just so easy to rent a space for like 10 pounds an hour or five pounds an hour and it's just like the upstairs of a pub and that's just a space that you can use to just move around if you want to if you feel like it and also um because um you know going into the uk which they have a more um you know they've developed more technology and that's the access to that i think the access just even just the library like it's just wow okay i don't have to i don't have to torrent these books i don't have to mm -hmm. i don't have to grab them from hey do you have a pdf copy of this like mm -hmm. no need for that they actually have the book itself so mm -hmm. that just that access that access which mm -hmm just has so it is so easy for them that's what i you know that's what i think yeah. when you mention torrent that doesn't mean you actually do torrent right because that's illegal of course <laughs> i actually deleted it when i came back because i actually deleted it when i came to the uk because you know it's not allowed there anymore right and, right you know, say, say no further <laughs> say no further <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you. Um, um, Dennis, this is still for you. Um, you mentioned Joe Ilianza, and he has a question for you. Uh, first, he says, "Great presentation," and uh, it's an overwhelming discourse. But he asks, "Can we really establish an academy of Philippine theater, given the context of a positionality or location of scholarships borrowed or a colonized theater uh, education?" Difficult question. Um, it's clear to me that I cannot prescribe what this Philippine Theatre Academy can be and should be. I think I have very limited uh, understanding of, uh, of the conception of this, but I think that it's important. This is an important gesture. And within this gesture, it has to, we have to reflect on how to decolonize our knowledge production, our knowledge circulation, and the way we curate what the way we curate and also the way we interact with our collaborators. What is an ethical way of collaborating? And this is something that I've experienced and I, 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 um, um, I imagine um, important to any theater uh, you know, communities. The ethical way of, of, of engaging with people, that people, like, like for example, this um, Tata Frank, he has a knowledge mm -hmm. also, right? So we have to dismantle all this el elitist idea that we have and um, blur some you know, uh, boundaries like what is this professional theater? What is this uh, community theater? We have to dismantle all these things mm -hmm. and come to terms with the tradition, the core of our tradition as people who can imagine and innovate performances. So mm -hmm. um, yeah, the colonization and ethical practice of theater is an important uh, aspect and we have to produce questions around this. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, thank you, Dennis. This, the next question I'm, I'm uh, uh, directing to Hope. And this question comes from Rob Arl de Guzman. I think this is Arlo de Guzman. So what is the portrait of a Philippine Academy of Theater graduate? So how do you imagine that, Hope? What would he be like? I know you mentioned some things already uh, in terms of what you wish it would be, but how would you describe the the a graduate of the Academy of Philippine Theater? Um, I would put it, again, going back to the early discussions here at um, Tampok, 
that the, the graduate or the, the products of this academy should um, uphold what we call in, in Yata, Pag-asa, and in, in, um, in Peta, the OAO format, uh, principle, mm -hmm. which is mm -hmm. basically they have, they are creative in the first place. Creative, they, are, they have an, an, uh, a higher level of expertise, but of course, there is always the, the heart for service to go back to the communities, to, to understand the history, and at the same time, be able to, to organize and be able to work, work uh, individually and with a group, and would be able to, to help create a, a more nurturing community of, of, of artists, of, of, theater, of theater performers, of, of drama, first people in the basically in the Philippines. So I think that's mm -hmm. what I imagine. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, Dennis, I have a question for you from Pepo Trimutige. Uh, well, first, uh, she mentions Dennis, that she looks- Dennis, we cannot hear you. Huh? You cannot hear me? We hello, hello. Hear. There, 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 okay. All right. Uh, de uh, this is for Dennis. <laughs> Dennis Gupa. This is from Pepo Trimutige uh, first. She says, Dennis, looking forward to your coming back home to the Philippines. And her question is, what difference or demarcation can you draw between community theater and applied theater? Yeah, thank you very much for that question. Um, applied theater is an umbrella term of many theater other practices, like uh, theater, theater in education, uh, theater for in the prison, theater for development, uh, community engaged performances. So it's a it's a it's an umbrella term. Okay. So Michael Balfour, the Australian applied theater scholar, defines this as a theater outside the confines of a traditional theater. When we call traditional theater the the the, the proscenium theater. All right. So a community theater is part of that, you know, uh, applied theater. Mm -hmm. It's a practice uh, mm -hmm. of, 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 of executing uh, 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 a performance. But um, the current discussion, the current discussion in applied theater right now, it's becoming a re uh, uh, pe pedagogy, you know, a, a tool for teaching a social mm -hmm. pedagogy. Mm -hmm. And right now my interest is how applied theater becomes uh, a tool for uh, inquiry of research, of doing a research. Mm -hmm. um, given that definition, Dominique, uh, do you think there should be a demarcation at all between community theater and applied theater? Uh, demar in, in a sense of um, not, I we should I don't think we should put a real you know a real like we shouldn't close the door I mean because right now I think what with what Dennis has been saying that it's a process of discovery that um, right now there might be in the future there might not be so I think what the the importance is we shouldn't try and close that door yet because there are aspects of applied theater that can be put into community theater and community theater could also use some applied theater practices so you know and in relation to establishing the academy i think that would be really important there that we should we shouldn't close the doors uh between them all right um dominic this i think uh, you'll be the best person to answer this this is from pat lucido um, do you have any tips for playwrights who want to incorporate elements or themes from pre-colonial Philippine literature and culture, perhaps as a means of decolonizing or regaining ownership of a Filipino theater? Uh, in terms of um, writing, it really helps to, especially if you're talking about pre-colonial Philippine literature, um, when I was thinking, I was thinking about this and I suddenly, you know, it suddenly occurred to me what what is pre-colonial Philippine theater? What like are we talking about? Um, Luzon, Visayas, Mindanao. So, is there even is there can we even consider pre-colonial Philippines? So, um, it's really tra um, and I uh, contended with this when I was doing Batang Mujahideen with Gelan and Tanghalang um, with TP in CCP that we really have to do a job of not just research but actually talking to people and it's 
there's there should be this element of humility when you have to say you know what i don't know enough about this i wish i knew more about this but i think it's time we really call in the people from let's say kambayoka let's call in the people from people from basilan let's call, let's really try and communicate with them and let's you know let's work with this so i think not and i think it's not just a matter of research because when we research it's all it's all in books it's all and we don't really get a sense of it and theater is very you know it's very physical so i think it really helps to just talk to people who have you know who have experiences of this all right uh, i think we have time for a couple of questions uh here's one for hope um there are some theater practitioners particularly in the regions that want to pursue uh, further or postgraduate studies in theater arts but they want to ask, are they qualified since some of them are, are college graduates, but from different programs? I mean, there are theater practitioners who graduated not from theater because we have very few theater programs to begin with. But do they have opportunities to pursue graduate studies in theater here or abroad? I, for one, graduated in mass communication. And my batchmate, Ted Najen Takan, was a mathematics, master's in mathematics. <laughs> He's a mathematician by profession and as a teacher. So, yes, of course, come to IPI. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah. I mean, I mean, in any aspect of, of, of um, the knowledge of a, of a human being can be used in, in, uh, in, in theater. So, in, in whichever field you come from, theater is always can be always applied no? or your knowledge can always be applied in theater so yeah mm -hmm. um okay maybe last question and uh, uh the, the last question that i'm posing to the our three panelists and even perhaps to philemon and even desa you can answer this is what do you want to see uh what are the next steps you want to see towards the formation of uh, an Academy of Philippine Theater. While you're thinking of your answer, I'll just read this comment from Amado RJ, um, who says that uh, uh, it's confusing here in the Philippines because we separate art from craft. Like a basket is a craft while painting is an art. But based on the Pangal of the Tubabao and in the discourse of Dennis, classifying the Pangal as an art is already a form of decolonization. And then there's another additional question to, to, uh, from Arlo de Guzman. What could be the mission of the Philippine Theater or, or uh, Philippine Academy of Theater on a, a global level? So uh, let's combine those two things. So how, what steps do you want to see and, and what's the end goal that you, you want to see? Um, I will start with uh, Dominique first. What are the what do you want? What steps do you want to see happen um, in the near future uh, um, that can work I, towards I the actually, academy? I um, got it from uh, that recent, that most recent comment that what could be the mission of the Academy of Theater? Just um, I think it would. What I would really like is you know more clarity on that, more um, more insight on that. That what is our mission? If our, our is our mission to train to to um, nurture all of that. Um, I really want to see you know what what we want the ideal. Uh, as the question earlier said, what we what do we want the ideal graduate to be, and what is our mission towards that? So that's personally that's what I want to see. All right, Dennis, what about you? Yeah, um, well, thank you very much for having me here. Uh, beautiful questions, difficult questions. Um, I, I, I think I went to theater because I want to be free. I want a society that cares. I want to, I, I want to contribute in making my community able to care with other people and community members and people who could imagine a caring, democratic country or society. And if we have a school, a theater school that is so clear in freeing and giving people to imagine themselves as free people who can think freely, who are not afraid to express their stories even the stories are, will put them in the edge of, of, of things. But this theater school can, will protect them and give them value as artists. That's, that's, that's the most amazing theater school. You know, uh, theater people 
who are not afraid and fearless. And this theater school will provide them protection when they articulate their imagination of what freedom is in a society that there's so much you know, chronic violence towards the body, there's extreme poverty, you know? So I, I guess that, that's a very philosophical idea, but I would enroll <laughs> if, I, if I will be given that freedom, you know? And to embrace that freedom and leave the school with the idea that I'm free and I will never be threatened. <laughs> Well said. Amen Hope, what, to that. <laughs> <laughs> what about you, Hope? What do you want to see happen soon or next? Amen, Dennis. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm really happy that someone asked about what, um, the prod, what kind of artist or product do you want to have for this academy? Because that should be the first step. And I think uh, Sir Thibault Fernandez already mentioned it, that that has to be the why, to answer the why. Why do we do this? What kind of artists do we want to produce? And I think that should be the first step because that will answer everything in my, in my opinion. When we know why we are doing this, when we understand why are we, why are we nurturing these artists into becoming into people who understand culture, people who are ready to defend culture, people who are ready to be champions of, 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 of Philippine culture and identity, then I think um, creating the design and, and, and everything else will, will follow. So uh, that is my opinion. Okay, good. Thank you, Hope. Dessa, what about you? Uh, after these nine weeks particularly, what do you want to see next? I'm sure you're excited as ever. Ako? <laughs> uh -oh. <laughs> um, actually, I will go back to uh, De Dennis Gupas ano, no? Kasi... I think all of us, um, somehow we have our own respective aha moments in theater. Mine was when I was 13 and I attended a six-week workshop with PETA. And that was totally life-changing. You know, one, I found a place where I don't want to get sick because I was asthmatic and I have rheumatic heart disease, but I wanted to live because every day was a chance to create and to discover and to, to work with other young people. Second, that in those six weeks, I found out more about Quiapo, Manila, the streets, in a sensorial way. And so I felt so alive. And then I, I felt that my stories were respected. I was recognized as a 13-year-old with a legitimate voice that, that is important, um, as, as is important as my teachers, my facilitators. And then it made me also a, a curious person. I wanted to know, you know, what is Fili being Filipino like outside of Manila, which created the desire to travel and, and to, I would volunteer uh, for, for, for giving workshops because it, made, it gave me an opportunity to know more about the world and beyond the Philippines later on. So it made me a better person, a better Filipino, a better global citizen. Um, but at the same time, every, every, every time knowing that there's so much to learn yet in terms of the artistic excellence, in terms of discourse, in terms of community building. So, um, so if there is a place <laughs> where my, you know, where, you know, our young members with YATA and, you know, like uh, SPA students or even teachers could go to, you know, just to, just to, to do that and, and discover more of, um, in, 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 you know, like in community with other theater practitioners and makers and meaning makers. Though I think the world will be a better place. So that is <laughs> my, you know, like that beyond this Sabadulaan is, um, one is to just filter and distill and make sense of the nine weeks of very rich, uh, abundant harvest. No? So um, the, the, the weaving will continue to happen. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Philemon, what about you? Uh, what do you want to see uh, happen next? 
Um, okay, that's a that's a very difficult question. Being the head now of the <laughs> on dramatic arts, um, uh, yeah. Uh, when we started this plan, no, uh, uh, you know, this idea of the the blue, I mean, an Academy of Philippine Theater started uh, in a previous term with Desa, and we really wanted this to to happen. And and my term is continuing this discussion, this conversation. Ako, I want to go back to that idea of ano ba talaga ang mission ng bakit ba we are trying to resurrect this no or revive this or re reinvigorate or revitalize this idea notion of you know an academy of Philippine theater. Ako, I want to go back to I, I started with Sini Kambayoka, which is a very strong, a very strong ang background ko with you know with folk theater with with, with the Bayok no, and then I went to study Singapore where I was. Uh, I was exposed no, to a lot of uh, Asian classical art system. One of the turning point then at that time was when my Japanese no teacher, uh, si Kanse Yoshimasa, asked me, so Felimon, uh, do you have a, uh, a classical theater system in the Philippines? And that for me was, yeah, we have. And then the next question was, are you teaching it in, in schools? You know, and then gusto kong balikan yung sinabi kanina na meron tayo pero uh, yeah, di ba parang nandun sa mga subject natin pero hindi siya itinuturo. And I think yan ang, yan ang gusto ko siguro pwedeng patunguhan ng, ng academy. Uh, I think that's yung sinasabi kanina ni, 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 ni Dennis na yung decolonization. I think masyado tayong, you know, we embrace so much from outside that sometimes nakakalimutan natin that we have a very strong uh, you know, a theater tradition, indigenous theater tradition in, in the country. And I think uh, parang gusto kong sabayan yung sinabi ni, ni Dennis na balikan natin yung what we have and you know, mm -hmm. pwede ito yung maituro. And I think that's one of the thread no, uh, uh, of, of, of this academy. No? Gaya ng sinabi ni Hope sa kanyang presentation na kung meron man yung kung meron mang mga traditional system ang ating at, you know, uh, neighboring countries, I think we need to also surface. Nandiyan na yan eh. Kaya, kaya lang hindi natin siya itinuturo. So that means, yung continuity niya, hindi siya napatuloy. It stops somewhere because hindi na siya na ituloy. And I hope, and I hope, really hope, that this academy will be the one to, you know, to help, you know, re revive or revitalize these uh, traditions in the country. All right. Thank you, Philemon. Uh, we've heard from our panelists. Uh, let's now hear from our uh, synthesizer, Sirika Palis, and uh, we'll try to see how he summarizes the <laughs> discussions this afternoon. Rika, take it away. Ay, magandang hapon sa inyong lahat. Maraming salamat. Hope, Dominic, Annie, and uh, Dennis. Napakaganda ng mga ibinahagi nyo uh, ngayong hapon. Ano? At habang, habang kayo ay nagkukwento, ako naman eh bumabalik din sa aking karanasan sa teatro no at uh, napakaganda nitong ideya ng isang academy akademiya ng dulaang Pilipino no pero tinatanong natin sa ating sarili para saan nga ba ang isang akademiya ng dulaang Pilipino uh, at uh, napakahaba na ng talakayan natin ng balitaktakan natin na kailang episodes na tayo at sa huling episode nga natin ay uh, inimbitahan natin ang mga scholar uh, ng dulaan na nag-aral sa iba yung dagat. Pero ang tanong, bakit nga ba kinakailangang lumabas ng bansa para mag-aral ng teatro o ng dulaan? Yan yung tanong ni Gardy kanina, di ba? Uh, bakit? What, kulang ba? Uh, kinukwento ni Desa yung karanasan niya sa PETA. Uh, marami rin akong mga kilalang mga kabataan na lum, uh, lumaki sa teatro at nakita nila kung ano ang kaibahang nagawa ng teatro sa buhay nila. Hindi lang sa sariling buhay nila, kundi sa kanila mga pamayanan. Pero bakit kailangan lumabas ng bansa para mag-aral ng teatro? Hindi mawawala sa isip ko yung isang pangyayari, hindi ko alam kung 2000 or 2001, sa isang meeting ng Committee on Dramatic Arts, na dumating ang isang Filimon Blanco na humihingi ng grant para idagdag sa kanyang scholarship sa ITTI. Sa ITI. And we gave him a measly amount of 50,000 pesos. Tama ba, Filimon? I think the following year, bumalik siya at kinwento niya ang kanyang scholarship. Parang humingi pa uli siya ng dagdag na grant sa NCCA, NCCA, NCDA. No? This very committee supported Filimon Blanco. And here is Filimon Blanco now serving as the head of this committee. No? 
Um, so, bakit ko binanggit ito? Nung panahon na yun, sumagi rin sa isip ko yung tanong na yun, kailangan niya lumabas, no? Pero alam ko naman na hindi naman si Pilimon Blanco ang kauna-unahang mandudula na nag-aral sa iba yung bansa. Marami na ring mga scholar na nag-aral sa ibang ba- ibang bansa, no? Nag-aral sila ng iba't ibang technique, iba-ibang mga traditions, no? So tingnan natin, no? Ang mga scholar na nakasalamuhan natin ngayong hapon ay may iba't ibang pinagbulan at konteksto sa Pilipinas, no? Merong nanggaling sa dulaan sa paaralan, sa kolehiyo, sa pamantasan, at meron ding nanggaling sa dula ang professional, no? In other words, nung pumunta tayo sa ibang bansa, uh, dala-dala natin ang sarili nating mga konteksto no sarili nating uh, mga pinanggalingang uh, konsepto ng teatro practice ng teatro no hindi tayo wala no nung pumunta tayo at mag-aral sa ibang bansa dala-dala natin ito ito yung puhunan natin at pagsisimula natin ng pag-unawa sa iba-ibang tradisyon ng teatro pagdating sa ibang bansa pagdating sa ibang bansa no ang Pilipinong mandudula bilang scholar sa iba yung dagat ay makakaharap ang iba't ibang realidad. Makakaharap niya, matututunan niya ang iba't ibang konteksto at tradisyon ng praktika at pagdalumat ng dulaan, no? Napakaraming bago, no? So nandoon yung yung aha moments mo ngayon na oh, may ganito pala. Bakit wala kaming ganito sa Pilipinas, no? Sana may ganito kami sa Pilipinas, no? Nandiyan din ang iba't ibang mga tradisyon at pamamaraan ng pagtuturo ng dula. Eh di lalo na kasi paano ba tinuturo talaga ang dula sa Pilipinas no uh, as as situated scholars we couldn't help but think of what is happening back home no habang habang y- kinukuwento niyo yan ano habang habang natututo kayo na challenge kayo ng mga bagong pagkatuto hindi nawawala sa isipan natin ng bakit kaya wala kami nito no okay at siyempre ang ang mga natututunan niyo na ito ay nakukulayan rin ng sarili niyong mga karanasan bilang dayuhan sa iba yung dagat, di ba? Kayo bilang Pilipino, kasalamuhan niyo ang ibang mga ibang mga nationalities sa inyong mga paaralan, no? May mga sarili kayong karanasan doon at bahagi ng proseso ng ng inyong pag-aaral ay ang refleksibong pag-unawa sa inyong mga bagong natutunan, no? Kung kaya humahantong ito sa paghahanap ng kabuluhan at saysay ng pag-aaral sa dula, ng dula sa sarili at sa bayan, no? Hindi ang, ang, ang nakita ko sa marami sa inyo, sa halos lahat sa inyo ay hindi tumitigil doon sa para ano bang saysay nito sa akin, no? Kundi pumupunta ito doon sa ano ba ang saysay nito sa aking bayan. Siguro may kinalaman dito yung mga pinanggalingan yung mga konteksto at tradisyon. Yung mga pinanggalingan nating praktika. At ito ang nagiging bataya natin sa pagbubuo ng ating haraya ng dulaan. So pagbalik natin sa Pilipinas, meron tayong mga konsepto ng dulaan na dala-dala natin. Dala-dala natin yan ng galing sa tatlo, apat o limang taon na pag-aaral ng dulaan sa iba yung dagat. So bakit nga ba talaga kinakailangan lumabas para mag-aral ng teatro? No? Sa mga ibinahagi nyo ngayong araw, nakita ko ang mga ito. Maghanap, matuto, magpakahusay, pero hindi nagtapos doon. Mag-angkat, siguro, manghiram, mag-angkin, magpakilala, makilala, mag-ambag, maghawan magsimula ng mga panibago, mag-innovate at maging makabuluhan. Nakita ko ito sa mga pagsasalay sa inyo at um, na I, I paid attention to some of the terms that you introduced that siguro uh, 20 years ago, <laughs> Dennis, take note, 20 or 30 years ago, Desa, take note, ay hindi wala sa, uh, wala sa bukabularyo o wala sa usap-usapan ng mga nasa teatro, no? interdisciplinarity, intercultural, creative industry, yung engagement in, with the community nandiyan yan simula sa Apple, no? Digital and technological innovations yung kinukuwento ni Dominic sa atin kanina. Decolonization ako nandiyan yan simula sa Apple. Pero makikita natin yung kinukuwento ni Dennis kanina, may mga pagbabago yung konsepto niya ng decolonization, ano? Pumasok na doon yung foregrounding of traditional ecological knowledge and indigenous worldviews. 
why did I pay attention to this? Sa pagbubuo natin ng isang akademiya, halos ang nilakbay ng ating mga scholar sa ibang bansa, no? yung pumunta sa ibang bansa, malamang meron ding kahalintulad na journey na dadaanan ang pagbubuo natin ng isang akademiya ng dula ang Filipino. Titingin tayo sa loob, aalamin natin ano bang meron tayo bilang mga Pilipino? Anong tradisyon ng dulaan meron tayo? Anong meron tayo noon? Ako napakayaman ng kasaysayan ng teatro sa Pilipinas. Napakayaman yan. Ay, alam yan ng mga cultural workers na nandyan na noong 1980s pa. At may mga dokumentasyon yan. No? Yun nga lang, hindi ito na isasalin. Hindi ito a sistematikong na ita-transmit no sa mga sumunod na uh, tradisyon o henerasyon ng mga alagad ng sining no anong meron tayo ngayon no Ay, hindi pwedeng sabihin na walang ginagawa ang mga alagad ng sining meron ano ang sitwasyon natin ngayon ano ang pangangala kailangan ng ating bayan ito yung loob no at nandiyan yung labas no pero sa paglakad ng panahon minsan hindi na natin mapag-iba yung loob at labas. Kagaya ng halimbawa, may loob din sa labas. May mga pamayan ng Pilipino, may mga teatro ng mga Pilipino sa labas at may mga labas dito sa loob, no? May mga alagad ng sining sa labas na nag-aaral dito sa atin sa loob, no? So, paano natin titingnan ang dynamics ng pag-aaral sa loob at pag-aaral sa labas, no? Maari tayong tumingin sa loob, tumanaw sa labas, no? At ang ginawa ng ating mga scholar, tumingin sila sa loob, tumanaw sa labas. Nang sa gayon, mapalakas natin ang loob. At mula sa loob ay magpalabas. Magpalabas <laughs> po. Maraming salamat at magandang <laughs> Maraming Sige. salamat, Rika, na pangiti mo kaming lahat. Uh, maraming salamat sa iyong paglalagom ng, ng mga nangyari ngayon. Gusto ko lamang dagdagan na, na meron lang akong naalala na um, anim na pong taon na nakakaraan may isang uh, nag-aaral sa Amerika na gagawa dapat ng kanyang doctoral dissertation at ang balak niyang gawin ay isang dissertasyon tungkol sa isang paksaing kanluranin. At sinabihan siya, bakit hindi paksaing Pilipino? At dahil sa kanyang naging desisyon na sundan ang, uh, ang, so, ang ang uh, sinabi sa kanya na nagumawa ng paksaing Pilipino na payaman ni Bienvenido Lumbera ang panitikan at kulturang Pilipino. Sa sa palagay ko parang ganoon din ang nangyayari sa atin ngayon. Narito ang ating mga panauhin na nag-aaral at sabi mo nga uh, Rika uh, na, hindi lamang nag-aaral para matuto kundi nag-aangkat din at nag-aambag din para sa ating uh, sariling kultura. Um, kagaya ni Desa, maaga ako nagsimula sa teatro. I started when I was 14 years old and I have a... Uh, yes, Gardi, I was 15 when I first knew you. <laughs> At uh, nung natagpuan ko ang teatro ay uh, hindi na ako nakakawala. <laughs> Sabi nga ganun. At gayon din naman siguro itong ating mga panelists ngayon who I would like to thank our amazing panel of speakers, Annie Luis, who had to leave earlier, Ernest Hope Tinambakan, Dominique La Victoria, and Dennis Gupa. And it has indeed been an, another enriching conversation filled with thought-provoking insights and, and challenges. I have learned a lot, and uh, it reminds me of the adage that uh, learning is lifelong. Ang pag-aaral ay panghabang buhay. But uh, so many great things uh, end, so this also ends our Tampok Sambadulaan or our Saturday Conversations on Theater. And uh, before I introduce uh, our, uh, our conference director, I'd like to thank the NCCA and the Committee on Dramatic Arts headed by Philemon Blanco, the Youth Advocates Through Theater Arts led by its artistic director and Tampok convener Desa Quesada Pam together with her team, Rai Bulfa, Nikki Simafranca, Dominic Deloso, Benji Kitay, Charisse Faith Amorganda, uh, Divine Arawiran, and Francia Pabiana. And now to close the series of rich sharing and exchange with this message, here is Tampo Conference Director, our esteemed and untiring theater visionary who I first knew when I was 15 years old. <laughs> <laughs> and leader, Lutgado Gardi Labad, Tampo's Conference Director. Gardi! Ay, salamat, Dennis. Kailangan ka babalik dito sa Bohol at para mag <laughs> at mag -dere. 
<laughs> lahat lahat kayo are you're all invited post pandemic era <laughs> to really share your knowledge your practices here in our Visayas region. Okay. Ang closing message ko ay hindi talaga message. Okay. <laughs> This is really uh, what a fast uh, recap. Uh, nakakatakot yung recap. Okay, basta we will review uh, mga parcels of thoughts from all the different napakagaling na mga session moderators, session uh, resource persons, mga synthesizers. So para lang ma-appreciate ma ma natin yung lawak na naging labyrinth sometimes, okay? Uh, babalikan ko yung mga main points ng lahat ng mga sessions, focusing on main points, answering several important questions, ano ang general konsepto nila ng direksyon, no, ng vision, yung bakit, ano ang konsepto nila ng uh, programa, anong konsepto nila ng struktura, anong konsepto nila ng funding, at, 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 at iba pang mga proseso para mabuo ito. Pero in general, wala namang, wala namang nagtaray. Di ba? Wala namang nagsabing, ah, ano ba yan? Hindi kailangan yan ngayon. Di ba? Wala naman. Lahat sila, parang buong-buo sa isip, sa puso, sa diwa nila na napakaganda itong lugar. Parang, yes, we need that. Okay? Yun ang naramdaman ko sa nine sessions na nangyari. Okay? Uh, pero siyempre, merong critical. Napaka-importante maging critical. Okay? So, so share ko sa inyo ngayon ang mga general trends, mga unifying comments, at saka mga var variations nila. Una, okay, so I will share my screen and from now on, I'll do a, a PowerPoint. Nandiyan na po. Nakikita na ba nyo? Okay. So. Okay. So, yan ang tampok. Sino, ano, ano yung mga sunod-sunod ng mga, ng mga uh, topics ano? at mga sessions para lang meron tayong overview. Ayan. Yan ang unang-unang session namin. Si Desa, ang ating convenor, ako director, conference director, at siyempre ang pinakahari namin lahat, <laughs> ang head ng Committee ng Dramatic Arts. No? So dito namin introduce kung ano yung bakit, bakit ba kinakailang gawin itong sabadulaan para matulungan ang pagsusulat ng isang blueprint na natawag namin pulmahan, isang proposal for the establishment of the Institute of Philippine Theater. Diyan namin nilatag ang general concept because, because alam namin hindi na pwedeng kami lang gumawa nito. Kailangan to isang guni sa buong pambansang komunidad ng teatro. Kaya iba-ibang mga dimensions ang inalatag at inimbita para magbigay ng kanilang mga karanasan at kuro-kuro. Ang una, ang konteksto. Ano bang konteksto? Bakit ba natin gagawin? Tama ba ito? Anong kinakailang malaman natin? Ano ang playing field? Anong historical field? Anong, anong, anong ecology na uh, gaga, gagampanan o mabubuhay o kung saan mabubuhay itong uh, institute or academy of Philippine Theater? Yan, si Arvin, si Carl, at si Glessy. Pangalawa, anong kahalagahan ng pag-aaral ng pamanang bayan? Pamanang lokal? Pamanang pambansa? Para ito, I mean, meron ba itong kahalagahan sa pag-aaral doon sa akademiya? Diyan po ang apat na magigiting nating mga history, cultural workers na napakagaling. And then, sumangguni tayo sa mga education experts in the field of theater. Sila yung mga leader sa kanilang mga pamantasan. Okay? From Manila hanggang sa Mindanao. Ayan sila. They had programs in their different universities. From there, pumunta tayo naman sa professional theater where theater is in a market, is an industry, is a profession. Meron bang konsepto ito sa academy? Ang tatlong yan ang nagbigay ng kahalagahan na ito po ay dapat maikawing, makakonek, or else paano tayo bubuhay, mabubuhay kung wala 
kung ating pag-aaralan ay hindi makakatulong sa ating future livelihood. Okay? Tapos, nakita rin natin kung paano na i-mainstream ang teatro sa development at sa governance. Itong apat na mga icons sa development work at governance work ay nagbigay din ng kanilang mga karanasan. And then, of course, I think tayo lang sa buong Pilipinas ang may ganitong klaseng aspeto. Hindi lang, uh, siguro hindi lang sa aesthetics or sa pedagogy ng theater and education, theater and small time organizing or small circle organizing, pero napakalaki po ng, ng ating karanasan sa pagbubuo, hindi lang isang grupo, isang regional network, isang national network. Ano bang sekreto niya? Napaka-importante ba ba nito? Sinabi nila, yes, sapagkat ito po ang larangan ng pagbubuo ng People's Theater. Yan, siyempre ang kabataan. Dapat pakinggan ang kabataan kasi hindi naman kami mga senior citizens ang mag-aaral dyan sa teatro niyan, sa akademiya. It's the youth. No? And they should see that there is a future for this kind of our academy. Ayan po ang ating magigiting na kabataan na na paso <laughs> katulad natin noon no sa sa apoy ng teatro at ito ngayon para karirinig lang natin ano ngayon ang kahalagahan ng mag-aral sa ibang bansa makakatulong ba ito sa pagpupunla ng ating akademi at i think it did napakaganda po ng kanilang mga karanasan so now that is just introduction okay <laughs> ito ngayon uh, just bear with me kasi uh, ang ginawa ko po, kumuha ko ng mga datos sa lahat ng mga grupong yan at ito po ang kanya-kanilang mga inputs. Hindi marami, I mean marami, pero mga main highlights po. Responses towards the strategic questions on vision, direction, and purpose. Ano bang desired impact nito sa lipunan in the future? Ito po, sa kaliwa, nandito yung mga Anong mga sessions ang nagsabi niyan? So sa session ng context, may nagsabi na it should aim at change and transformation. Nagbabago ang mundo, nagbabago din ang mundo ng tanghalan. Dapat ginagawa natin ang paghabi ng kamalayan. Dapat tumulong tayo sa pagbubuo ng tamang kamalayan. Ang nagsasangasangang tinig at hangarin ng komunidad makapagtatag ng isang tahanan na tunay na kakatawan sa diwa ng akademi. So, ang vision ay tahanan para sa isang pagbabago. Sa heritage section, nasabi ay teatro ay buhay. Ay try, ang teatro ay buhay, ang teatro ay buhay, at ang teatro ay ating pamana. Ang sasailalim sa mga pagsasanay sa lidangan na ito ay mga manggagawang kultural at pan-teatro na nakikinig o nagkukumyun, nakikiniig kumyun sa komunidad o sa Bisaya, Katilingban. Ang Theater in Development and Governance, anong kanyang vision dapat in the future? Itong teatro nakatulong sa pag-safeguard ng cultural heritage, nakapag-promote ng cultural development, nakabuild ng isang collective memory ng ating bayan, ng isang bansa, nakapag-develop sa economic sense through tourism industry, nakapag-address sa developmental issues, hindi lang sa arts, hindi lang sa aesthetic is pero nakatulong sa pagbubuo ng isang tao, ng mga sa pagbubuo ulit, nag-heal sa mga wounds ng ating mga vulnerable sectors. At kaya nakaka-build ng creative, sustainable community. Something in the, in the previous years, ano? theater and community work and community development work at there was a time na that was paradoxical or talaga opposing at ito pong ginawa ni professor Dr. Ferro Dutige sa kanyang pag uh, talaga pag visualize ng future ng akademiya talagang may impact sa market sa industriya sa kinabuhi pag pa, uh, sa livelihood no ang learners entering into the academy pupunta sila sa mga field schools. No? Yung field schools through, ter through territories, sa persuasiveness, across borders, at through the academy, magsusupply tayo na may graduates para magkaroon ng revitalized, re-empowered, indigenized creative industry. Yun po ang kanyang uh, visual graph ng uh, academy. Ano naman ang 
other aspects ng nate ng nitong academy at kaya mga objectives, no? Ang sabi ng heritage, ito ay magiging linangan, linangan, linangan ng dulaang Pilipino. Paghahabi, hinahabi natin collectively ang karanasan at kaisipan. At dito, ang kahalagahan ng kasaysayan, kultura, pamana at kaalamang bayan sa paglikha ng sining. So, hindi lang art, no, the formal aspects of aesthetics, nakaground, nakakontekstualize sa history, culture, heritage, and people's wisdom. Okay? Pamana ng komunidad niyang teatro. From theater education, sabi nila, it should focus on aspects of theater and performance and how will it address the needs of theater meaning-making as praxis, pedagogy, and production. From the region, local or national level representing culture, but reflecting, okay, or portraying, or uh, exploring national identity. Pero din ang sabi sa theater education, it's a gathering of the learned, the committed, the scholar and the expert. Okay? It is also an academy, the Philippine Theater, as a public service academy. It is also an academy of Philippine performance. Ang mga kabataan naman, it should serve as a laboratory and platform for mapping all kinds of exchanges. Okay? Nakita mo the dynamism ng youth, dapat laboratory, nag-explore, nag-experiment, a space to collectivize our vision and action, following the principles of cultivating culturally responsive processes and pedagogies. Aside from being a cradle of development, it is a platform where exchanges from varying scales, immediate, national, and intergenerational are facilitated. It should generate capacities that are regenerative, sustainable, and care-based, tingnan nyo, self, community, and nature following the anthropocentric nature of our processes nowadays. Very ecological ang dimension na ito. Okay? From theater education, sinabi din nila, there is this value-added institution. It's more than aesthetics. No? Sa theater meaning making, nandiyan ang message, insight, and philosophy not more than aesthetics. It must be critical, transformative, transcendent, responsive, ito na ang more than aesthetics, to the needs and truths of the communities. Also, nakikita nila that it should guide existing programs of education department. Okay? O sabi naman ng professional theater, nandyan na lahat. Meron na mga best practices sa professionalization ng theater. Nandiyan yung paggamit ng theater for the development of the nation. Nandiyan ang pedagogy academic practice tungo sa kamalayang Pilipino. Nandiyan ang mga networks, ang art schools, ang numerous performances na naghahabi ng isang aesthetic sa Philippine theater. Meron ang market, may government support, may support ng the private sector, may gumamit ng theater sa development, at meron ang interaction ng mga ating mga artists. So, dapat ito ipagtahik-tahe, ihahabihin. Okay? Magkaroon ng isang hobby ng kamalayan. Sapagkat, we are not starting from scratch. Okay. Okay. Ito yung sabi nyo natin ito. Okay. So, organizing and networking. Sinabi, ito rin ang synthesis ni Fe. Okay. Nandyan din, nakita, dapat tingnan din natin that it should really come up with a model of supply and demand for sustainability. Hindi gastos lang. Okay? Hindi ka nag-invest. Anong mangyayari dyan? Dapat matulong para sa, uh, sa uh, market, uh, sa pagbubukon ng audience no? ng isang market for theater. Okay? At ito, organizing tool for strengthening the OAO. Dapat nandyan ang dialogical approach of naming your own word. And then ito maganda. Networks are self-contained academies. They are field schools. Ganda class ang nature, hindi isang center. Ang mga centers na doon nagkalat kasi merong field schools of experts, of expertise. Okay? Where there is an immersion of community culture, production, creative processes. Centers of excellence. Okay? Ang youth naman, okay, it is important dito to map the pre-life, the performance, the post-life of the performance. Okay? Ito, napakaganda. Binold ko talaga. Ito, dapat rito sa academy na ito, dapat ma-map and language and vocabulary of the people, the masses, to further direct our practices 
to become much more socially relevant and engaged. Napakagandang connection, di ba? Hindi tayo nag-i-interpret lang without emerging or emer um, uh, really going down and really learn from the people. But there are some gaps between the language that we use as theater ma makers and the language that our people use. It's only necessary to bridge these communication gaps by means of aligning ourselves with our community. Okay. Sabi naman ng context, ayan, napakaganda, karanasan, kasaysayan, at pagbabago. Gumamit ang indigenous local concepts, ganap, batubalani, bayanihan, bayan, babaylan, from the different cultural theory scholars, from Lombera, Johnson, Mahares, Alvarez, etc. The integration of history in the role of theater and culture in the shaping of a movement for cultural liberation. Di ba kanina? Decolonization, yan yan. Okay? Gamitin ang lingwahe, gamitin ang kultura. Incorporate Filipino values. That's one way of approaching, sa sabi kanina ni Dennis, ang decolonizing. Heritage. Sa paghahabog ng linangan ng gulang Pilipino, mahalagang bigyang pansin ang historical at cultural na material na siyang nagsisilbing inspirasyon sa mga pagtatanghal para mapanatiling buhay ang local culture at mapalakas din ang cultural identity ng komunidad. Merong task tayo na palakasin ang uh, tawag namin sa Bisaya, kinaiya sa katilingban. Mahalagang mapanatiling buhay at madocument itong mga tradisyon na ito through the theater. Hindi lang cultural anthropologists. The theater actors, the theater actors should be social anthropologists themselves. Okay? Napakahalaga ng pagiging actor, di ba? Actor, teacher, artist, researcher. Yan. Kaya may cultural mapping. Sabi niyo sa heritage, No? Historical, ayan, basahin nyo nyo na, pagdodokumento, pananaliksik, ayan, naulit lang. <laughs> Theater education, ano mga programa? Conference, symposia, festival, research, creative endeavors. Dapat, ayan na, may database or archive of Philippine theater. Mag-assist in resource training and workshop. Ang kanyang institutional focus, network building. Establishing multiple centers across the country. Hindi po isang center na sa Manila, or sa Cibisaya, sa isang lugar lang, talagang multiple centers of theater excellence. Okay? Ang youth, sabi ng youth, kailang ma-articulate a whole gamut of methodologies brought about by the emergence of a variety of online and on-ground practices by many practitioners in the Philippines now. Okay? So, hihinga muna ako. Hinga, inhale, exhale. Okay? Theater education, Theater Academy, Research, Performance Focus, ito po. Tingnan nyo. Weaving hybridity and fusion in performances like those indigenizing, localizing, contextualizing, world's classical texts, locales, and spectacles. Merging and transcreating in the interest of careful representations that spin up between what is authentic and inauthentic. Kasi or else will be going up sa problema ng misappropriation. Kaya careful, ethical ang paggamit ng hybridity and fusion so that the theater community can locate the global in the local and bring what is local globally is theater and its narratives are the gifts to the world. So, andyan na po yung mga terms na yan, no? multidisciplinary, transdisciplinary, or even anti-disciplinary aspects of theater meaning and academy. Okay? The professional theater shaping of practices of the current trailblazer. Ang sabi sa theater in development, three structured program, leadership, academics, and cultural development. Dapat daw modular, cross-cultural, immersion, and exchange. Yan. Okay? Ang youth, eh, sabi na natin yung youth. Okay? Ito ang mga iba-ibang sinabi ng iba-ibang mga regions. Okay? Yan. Ngayon sa organizational at management issues. Ang sabi ng heritage, multi-campus or multi-centered kung saan naaangkop ang curriculum, okay? iba-ibang focus no? or expertise ng isang center. Theater education, function should be defined first before forming the academy. Bakit? Ano bang function ito? Sabi natin kanina, by defining the function, was one must consider the expressions that evolve from culture. In other words, these are structured by cultural conventions. There's also a 
suggestion that they can follow the structural paradigms of IFTR, the International Federation for Theater Research, and sabi ng development and governance, this multi-center na academy should be regional learning centers or hubs with strong existing regionalized structural base managed by cultural leaders with strong social infrastructure with new transformative leadership and with critical representation. For support issues, ang sabi ng theater education, theater that flourishes in universities, but they cannot do it alone. So they need the support of all the other stakeholders. Thus, the academy may facilitate resources and expertise sharing, and that includes regions to be given equal opportunities. The academy may institutionalize Philippine theater industry as a backup and as, a, as an audience, as the, kung saan mapupunta. So it looks also into artist welfare and labor rights. So, sabi ng development and governance is this must be state-sponsored, state-supported, free, but at the same time, ang ownership ay nasa katilingban, nasa pamayanan. Okay? Yan, isipin na lang natin mga nangkaraan sa araw na ito. Okay? At ito po, ang response sa man, anong role ng itong APT na ito sa pandemic era? Sa panahon ng pandemya, magiging pagtuunan ng pansin ang pagdodokumento at pagsasaayos ng mga materyales sa mga grupo at pagtatanghal. Kailangan alamin kung anong mag, mapaghahalo ang paggamit ng digital at traditional na pamamaraan. Sabi ng Theater Education, the COVID-19 pandemic has affected the theater community. Theater amid the pandemic must be engaged in virtual multimedia streaming via social media. The streaming of plays will engage and even reach a greater number of audience. Sabi nga ni Mukti, ng ating ang head ng drama sa, sa Binil, no? Brave New World. Okay? Uh, getting from Orwell. This new world is taken from the society that is menaced by this virus coupled with controversial motivation, etc. So dapat the wizardry of the internet, despite the pandemic or whatever barriers or challenges there may be, it must allow theater meaning makers to share narratives and intimations of life so all will live and love. Sa professional theater naman, ang sabi ng theater, of course, give, given the condition now, dapat innovation is the name of the word. Okay? And then sa youth, again, variety of knowledge that come from different communities. Okay? These challenging times have seen, have shown, uh, itong bagong mga words na ito, the precarity of our situation which lead to numerous opportunities to create and archive new practices. May mga other questions na dapat masagot din. Sustainable ba ito? Paano? What does it want to achieve? What sets it apart from all the rest? Why an academy and for whom? I think the answer na naman yun, nakaspread out lang, pero, but that is really the sine qua non question that must have a sine qua non answer. Organizing and networking. Yeah, but the NCCA can be the midwife of the birthing of this academy that includes every practitioner without competing with each other, looking at each other's core competencies, reinforcing each other and building that Philippine theater industry. Question, is this the appropriate time to assert the role of theater as a driver of developing a Filipino culture, Kamalayang Filipino, Filipina. Okay? Ang youth, there is a variety of things. Ganun palagi, a variety of knowledge. And, susunod, ito na po. So, yon po. Sorry, pero talagang I, I tried my best na ma-review with all of you yung mga highlights of all of those eight sessions. Ano pong gagawin natin ngayon ng CTA, ng in charge sa master sa blueprint from here on because that's a whole a whole lot of materials that we are going to blow through, okay? And next steps ito po ang aming ang isa sa ito, ang aming na plano, i-consolidate po lahat ng inputs ng tampok sa badilaan at gagawan ng comprehensive report. And of course, this should be available to all of those 
who participated. From there, we will finalize the outline of that blueprint for the academy and we will present it to the Committee on Dramatic Arts. Okay? Of course, doon sa outline na yan, makikita na rin natin kung saan may papasok yung mga inputs na galing sa sabagulahan. From there, kung na-approve na ng CDA ang outline na yan, then palalalimin natin ang pagsusuri at pagproposes ng mga inputs na yon At dahan-dahan, ipapasok ang lahat ng laman sa blueprint, dadagdagan, para maisulat na ang first draft ng blueprint. Okay? From there, gagawa kami ng smaller circles of consultation. Okay? Pwede yun tungkol sa curriculum, tungkol sa community work, yung mga dinaanan, ano pang ibig sabihin nito? Ano mga ideas? Ano mga programa? Ano activities? Okay? Organize smaller circles of consultation to further flesh out ideas, aspects of the academy. Blended technology research. From there, susulat na naman ang main text of the draft. And from there, represent sa NCCA CDA. And then, kung okay na sa CDA, then we will present the draft of the blueprint to representatives of the theater community for last comments and further enhancement. By that time, parang tampok sa badulaan ulit. So, invest kulmahan sa badulaan siguro ang, ang title na para magkaroon ng final consultation and then final pagsusulat and then submission to the NCCA. Hi, kinum na ako ng tubig. Marami pong salamat sa inyong lahat. <laughs> wow! That was uh, quite a lot, Gardi. Thank you very much. Um, ang bigat. <laughs> ma 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 mahaba na pagdaanan at mukhang marami pa ang dadaanan. Ng, yes. Oo. Uh, gayun pa man, nagpapasalamat uh, tayong lahat sa lahat na naging bahagi ng Tampok sa Badulaan, lalo na sa ating mga panelists ngayong hapon. And um, with that, uh, uh, for those who are, who are still here with us, uh, please don't leave. We will ask you to turn off your cameras and join us later after we finish the streaming. But for now, uh, thank you, Gardi. And on behalf of the Tampok Sabadulaan team from Filimon Blanco of the NCCA CDA and uh, Desa Quesada Pam and her team, this is Dennis Marasigan signing off. Mabuhay at padayon. Mabuhay.
Yay! Congratulations! Oh Marathon! Dennis, are you still alive in Canada? It's 3.30. Well, nawala na siya. Oh no. Anyway, <laughs> yeah, no. kasi nga 3.30 na morning. Uh, sige, invite natin yung mga ano, yung ating ano, mga attendees na nako full support ang mga ITI. Ano? <laughs> Yes, ni-require ko yan. Oo oh, nga, and Jem Jen. Hello, Sir Michael. Welcome back. And then sila, Marites. Yay! Paki-open naman ng ano, Rocky. My God. <laughs> Open ng videos po para ano, para makapicture at makakain na tayo, di ba? <laughs> Sige, alright. O si Ishma, nandyan si Ishma. Ishmael, Everyone here. Si Miss Siti, Zubaida. Ay, Ish. Sige, sino pa? Si, si Sir Pat? Nandyan ba kayo? Paano naman ang video? LD? Okay. Si Gardy. Ha? Oo, Gardy. Yung mukha mo naman. O, kasi nakabarong ka eh. <laughs> o, diba? Hindi ako nag, ano, nagbarong. Oh, Nag-formal-formal. Okay lang. So, sige ha. One, two, three, and... Yay! One, two, three... One more. For good measure. One, two, three, and... Energy! Yay! Anyway, sige. Maraming maraming salamat. Okay. At, thank you. Uh, oh my God. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Congratulations, salamat. Thank you po. Congratulations. Yes, salamat, Divine. Nakatulong yung... Divine, yung... salamat. Thank you po. Pati na lang. Sige. Talaga, Sir Gardy. Photo finish ka. O, oh, diba? <laughs> Pati yung youth kasama na. Anyway. Thank you, Gardy. Thank you, Desa. Thank you, Philip. Thank you, Dennis. Thank you. Ah, my pleasure. Ang mahabang history natin sa isa. Oo, sige. Sige, meron pa akong interview sa PETA ngayon. Sige na, bye-bye. Bye, 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 bye. Bye-bye. I'm sure, Dennis, by this time, marami nagsasabi, Naku, Sir Dennis, 12 po ako nung nakilala ko kayo. Ano ba? Meron nga ako yung mga bata pa talaga. Marami na. Ano ka ba? Well, to begin with, yung mga anak mo, di ba? Lumaki sa PETA. Rika, that was excellent na synthesis. Sabi ko, naku, talagang Ganda na synthesis ni Rika. Kahit na, ni Rasha, hospital ang anak eh. Talagang may ano eh. Sabi ko, ang ganda nung ano, kima. Ang ganda nung punchline. At saka yung punchline. Hindi ko na-save eh. Hindi ko na-picture. But I'll see it in the recording. Oo nga, para maano natin yung ano talaga, punchline na. Kaya mag- Si classmate Filipon pa ang ano ah. Ang model ng international studies. Nagkaroon pa in CCE naman, 50 lang, dagdagan nyo. Oo, diba? 50 lang ang binigay natin kay Filimon noon. Cardi. Ano, tumaas-taas ba sa panahon ni ano ni Denise? Tumaas na pala. Hindi ko alam. Hindi ko alam. Hindi ko alam. After yung sa time na ako. At pagkatapos noon, nanatili na doon. Nanatili na sa 100. Nako. Anyway. Sige. So, yung ating mga ano dakilang mga SPA teachers, sila Janelyn, sila, I guess, no, si Sir Michael, si LD, Ms. Marites, I think. Congrats, Yata. Dagang salam. Oo, oh, hindi. Talagang okay. ano. Uh, uh, grabe, para akong dumaan sa isang ano, school year ng pag-aaral na. Oo. <laughs> na ano Actually, itong, itong buong series na to, pwede na siyang isang course. Actually, oh, okay. course stuck on theater. Oo, oh, totoo. Oo, maghahanda na ako ng ano, ng compre, compre exams based, <laughs> sa, based sa lahat ng mga ano. Anyway, yeah, so, sige, yan ano din yeah, namin, ilinisin namin and then we will upload. Pero siguro, Philemon, we need to really create a We can, ano muna, within yata. Pero I think at some point, CDA, sana CDA na YouTube para doon talaga siya pumasok. Ah, uh, yung, uh -oh. ano, yung lahat na. Parang, oo. Oh -oh. So, pwede ibigay ko yung ano, account para 
i-upload niya doon sa ano? Sa ah, may YouTube na ba? May YouTube oh, uh, ano na ang... Ito na nung last time, pero we decided na sa Facebook mo na so saka na i-upload. So may meron ah, na ako na ginawa. Ibigay ko lang yung account sa sa inyo para... Ah, sige. Para i-upload namin yung mga uh, yung mga videos. So, uh, wonderful. Anyway, sige again, maraming salamat. Venice! <laughs> It's too rough. Let's not cheek at all. I'm preparing na po. <laughs> oh nga, kasi parang may ano, madagdag na bisaya kay si, si Hope I both Visayas Mindanao, si Marvin ang ano, uh, Bohol. Oh, at least meron ano, ano, West Visayas. Huh? Meron pong tag Oh Lord, nag-message sa akin after ng ano ni Hope presentation. Oh, gusto na enroll, sabi. Sabi. Oh. Sino miss? Sino miss? Actually, p- pwedeng i-cut lang yung video presentation ni Hope. Tapos oh. pwedeng yun na yung i-tour for ITI uh, recruitment. <laughs> oh, YouTube yun actually. Di, teka, so, asa, di ba, next ano, kailan ka ba magsa-start-ish? Ah, nag-start na po ako. Ah, nandito, nandito, na. Na. nandito na po ako. Ah, na, sa Singapore ka ba ngayon? Opo. Ah, so, marami kayo kasi kabatch mo si Carlwin. Kabatch kami ni Carlwin. So, dapat, kapil sana si Ona. Ayan, oo nga eh. Sige lang, iba-iba ang mga ano, minsan. <laughs> sa buhay. Anyway. Iba-iba. Oo. Sige. Again, maraming salamat uli sa lahat. No? Nakakatuwa. Oo. It's divine. Salamat. Maganda tayo. Bye-bye. Congrats, Yata. Congrats. Congrats, Yata. Congrats. 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 Oo. Ano to? Talagang collective effort. Nakaka-ano. Oo. Rika. Ano ha, I hope, balit, i-update mo lang ako kay Johanna kung ano yung uh, results. So, we'll keep him in our prayers. So. Uh-oh. Pero nakita ko, nandun siya sa Facebook at sa mga po. Inaabangan ito ang nanay niya. <laughs> Oo. Eh, biglang, ano eh, biglang, may lecture, may, may, may lecture pa pala si Gardy, sabi ko, closing message. <laughs> Sabi niya, ano yung chapter yun? Sabi niya, ano, um, 10 minutes Prologue. lang. 10 minutes lang. Tapos pero sabi niya, may PowerPoint ako. Sabi ko, naku, lago. <laughs> <laughs> pero hindi, okay naman na, ano na. Kung hindi ka naka-attend ng first eight, uh, 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 kulit uh, uh, kasi uh, para, uh, ah, yung pala yun. <laughs> para siyang, ano, re- uh, uh, review, o, <laughs> oh, oh, review. Oh. Anyway, sige, thank you again, ha, to all of you. Ingat ka dyan, Ish. Oo, I hope, ano, I hope kumakain pa rin kayo ng matino. <laughs> ano ka ngayon, may inuman sa Ha? Meron kaming electronic <laughs> inuman <laughs> ngayon. Oh my God! <laughs> ang itchy ka ninyo, ha? Oo. Uh-huh. Ah, sige, ang, ang wine natin, Filimon, ano? Nandiyan na. See ya later. See ya. Bye bye. See you, sir. Feeling one hope. See you. Yeah. See ya. Ay. <laughs>